R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 4, Chapters 21 through 25. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 21, Salvaging the Wrecked Family Fortunes. If there had been anything in auguries, the summer of 1868 should have been the happiest of seasons for the Lees, for it began with the suggestion of a high honor, nothing less than that General Lee be made the Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States. It was a qualified proposal, to be sure, for it was postulated on the assumption that the Democrats had to name a soldier to defeat General Grant, the Republican choice. The New York Herald put Lee's name forward in an editorial that read in part as follows. But if the Democratic Committee must nominate a soldier, if it must have a name identified with the glories of the war, we will recommend a candidate for its favors. Let it nominate General R. E. Lee. Let it boldly take over the best of all its soldiers, making no palaver or apology. He is a better soldier than any of those they have thought upon and a greater man. He is one in whom the only genius of this nation finds its fullest development. Here the inequality will be in favor of the Democrats for this soldier, with a handful of men whom he had molded into an army, baffled our greater northern armies for four years, and when opposed by Grant was only worn down by that solid strategy of stupidity that accomplishes its strategy by mere weight. With one quarter the men Grant had this soldier fought magnificently across the territory of his native state and fought his army to a stump. There never was such an army or such a campaign or such a general for illustrating the military genius and possibilities of our people, and this general is the best of all for a Democratic candidate. It is certain that with half as many men as Grant he would have beaten him from the field in Virginia, and he affords the best promise of any soldier for beating him again. Lee must have smiled at this article, if, indeed, he saw it, but the auguries were not fulfilled. He had little time and perhaps little heart for smiling that summer. Sickness dogged the family. Mrs. Lee had become nervous and had been brooding so much over the plight of the South over military rule that her husband had feared she would aggravate her physical condition. Agnes had been sick while in Maryland and though she had not yet come home, was said to be looking very unwell. The general planned to take all of them away, and after he had comfortably established them at the springs Mrs. Lee preferred, he intended to go on with Mildred to the white sulphur and to drink its waters for his rheumatism. It was July 14 before the first stage of this journey be undertaken and the family moved to the warm springs. There it was assigned to the Brockenbro cottage, with Mrs. Lee on the first floor and her daughters in the rooms above. All might have gone well had not Mildred contracted a low, debilitating fever which the doctor diagnosed as typhoid. Her mother, of course, could not nurse her. The burden fell on the general and on Agnes. In her sickness, Mildred developed whimsies and insisted that she could not sleep unless her father sat by her and held her hand. He did not try to argue her out of this or to substitute someone else for the vigils. Night after night he stayed there, in the little upstairs chamber of the cottage, until the dance was over and the chatter ceased on the lawn and the lamps went out. What was he thinking about through those long hours, he who had commanded tens of thousands of men in the bloodiest battles of the continent, and yet had spent so many of his days as nurse to mother, to invalid wife, and to children? It was August 14 before Mildred was pronounced convalescent, and even then she was so weak she could not speak. When she recovered sufficiently to travel, the general took her and the rest of the family from the warm to the hot springs and, after a few days, went on with Mildred to the white sulphur. He found a large gathering of former Confederates there, including many of his old generals and not a few of the civil officials of the dead government. Nearly all of them were talking politics. Grant and Schuyler Colfax had been nominated by the Republicans. Against them, the Democrats had entered Governor Horatio Seymour and Francis P. Blair. Recent as was the war, some of the Democrats believed that they had a chance of electing their candidates, and certain of those at the Springs were busily devising ways and means to that end. Already the alarmed Republicans were warning the North that the South was unreconciled and that the Negroes were being unfairly treated and that the election of Seymour and Blair would undo the victory won at the cost of so much blood. General Lee, of course, had little part in these discussions. 
In fact, he avoided politics so sedulously that more than one of his comrades complained privately that he was distinctly cool to them. Unexpectedly, however, he found himself involved in the controversy. General W. S. Rosecrans, one of the managers of the Democratic campaign, knew that some of the leading Southerners visited the White every summer, and he came down from New York to see if he could procure from them a statement of their acceptance of the results of the war and of their willingness to deal justly with the Negroes. This, in General Rosecrans's opinion, might offset the Republican propaganda and help the Democratic thicket. Naturally, Rosecrans consulted Lee first of all upon his arrival and explained that Lee was a representative Southerner, his assurance of the South's loyalty to the Union would carry weight in the North. Lee demurred. He could not assume to speak for the South, he said, if Rosecrans wished to know the feeling of the former Confederacy, he could inquire of the public men who were at the Springs. Being willing to ask in the name of politics what he would not have sought for himself personally, Rosecrans requested Lee to bring these gentlemen together that he might meet them. Lee's politeness and his desire to help in the restoration of good feeling prompted him to accede and to invite a number of former soldiers and publicists to his cottage. There, while Lee was noticeably quiet, General Rosecrans exchanged opinions with Beauregard, Alexander H. Stevens, and others. Nearly all of them assured him of the willingness of the people to support the Union and to deal justly with the Negro. Only the last man to be asked for his views, ex-Governor F. W. Stockdale of Texas, spoke out bluntly and said that the South would keep the peace but was not a dog to lick the hand of the man that kicked it. Lee then rose and brought the conference to an end. Rosecrans was not through. On August 26, he addressed Lee a formal letter asking that the Southerners with whom he had conferred at the cottage unite in a formal statement of their views. Anxious as Lee was to allay ill feeling and to heal the wounds of war, such a request was embarrassing. He had never written a line on politics for publication since the war, and he hesitated to break his rule, especially as he was unfamiliar with the language of political discussion. What, then, should he do? Among the guests at the Springs was Alexander H. H. Stewart, a Virginia lawyer of much sagacity and judgment, who had been Secretary of the Interior under Fillmore. Stewart's good sense showed him that Virginia had to pay a price for a return of her rights of statehood and he was working quietly but skillfully to that end. He was the man Lee needed to help him, for he could be relied upon to show conservatism along with candor. Through General John Eccles, Lee sent Rosecrans's letter to Stewart and asked him to write an answer. In a short time Stewart brought a draft which Lee read over carefully and slowly in the lawyer's presence. It was to this effect. General. I have the honor to receive your letter of this date, and, in accordance with your suggestion, I have conferred with a number of gentlemen from the South, in whose judgment I have confidence, and who are well acquainted with the public sentiment of their respective states. They have kindly consented to unite with me in replying to your communication, and their names will be found, with my own, appended to this answer. With this explanation, we proceed to give you a candid statement of what we believe to be the sentiment of the Southern people in regard to the subjects to which you refer. Whatever opinions may have prevailed in the past with regard to African slavery or the right of a state to secede from the Union, we believe we express the almost unanimous judgment of the Southern people when we declare that they consider these questions were decided by the war and that it is their intention in good faith to abide by that decision. At the close of the war, the Southern people laid down their arms and sought to resume their former relations to the government of the United States. Through their state conventions, they abolished slavery and annulled their ordinances of secession, and they returned to their peaceful pursuits with a sincere purpose to fulfill all their duties under the Constitution of the United States which they had sworn to support. If their action in these particulars had been met in a spirit of frankness and cordiality, we believe that, ere this, old irritations would have passed away and the wounds inflicted by the war would have been, in a large measure, healed. As far as we are advised, the people of the South entertain no unfriendly feeling towards the government of the United States, but they complain that their rights under the Constitution are withheld from them in the administration thereof. The idea that the Southern people are hostile to the Negroes and would oppress them, if it were in their power to do so, is entirely unfounded. They have grown up in our midst, and we have been accustomed from childhood to look upon them with kindness. The change in the relations of the two races has brought no change in our feelings towards them. They still continue an important part of our laboring population. 
Without their labor, the lands of the South would be comparatively unproductive, without the employment which Southern agriculture affords, they would be destitute of the means of subsistence and become paupers, dependent upon public bounty. Self-interest, if there were no higher motive, would therefore prompt the whites of the South to extend to the Negro care and protection. The important fact that the two races are, under existing circumstances, necessary to each other is gradually becoming apparent to both, and we believe that but for malign influences exerted to stir up the passions of the Negroes, the relations of the two races would soon adjust themselves on a basis of mutual kindness and advantage. It is true that the people of the South, in common with a large majority of the people of the North and West, are, for obvious reasons, inflexibly opposed to any system of laws that would place the political power of the country in the hands of the Negro race. But this opposition springs from no feeling of enmity, but from a deep-seated conviction that, at present, the Negroes have neither the intelligence nor the other qualifications which are necessary to make them safe depositories of political power. They would inevitably become the victims of demagogues who, for selfish purposes, would mislead them to the serious injury of the public. The great want of the South is peace. The people earnestly desire tranquility and restoration of the Union. They deplore disorder and excitement as the most serious obstacle to their prosperity. They ask a restoration of their rights under the Constitution. They desire relief from oppressive misrule. Above all, they would appeal to their countrymen for the re-establishment, in the southern states, of that which has been justly regarded as the birthright of every American, the right of self-government. Establish these on a firm basis, and we can safely promise, on behalf of the southern people, that they will faithfully obey the Constitution and laws of the United States, treat the Negro populations with kindness and humanity and fulfill every duty incumbent and peaceful citizens, loyal to the Constitution of their country. All this was what Lee had been thinking and saying ever since May, 1865. The language was slightly more rhetorical than he would have employed, but the sentiments were precisely his. A single change was all Lee thought necessary. Stewart, in speaking of the development of better relations between the races, had said, but for malign influences exerted to stir up the passions of the Negroes, etc. That grated on Lee. Mr. Stewart, he said, there is one word I would like to strike out if you have no objection. You have used the word malign. I think that is rather a harsh word, and, he smiled as he went on, I never did like adjectives. Mr. Stewart immediately erased the offending word, and the letter was approved. Lee signed it, as did 31 other leading Southerners at the Springs. It was forwarded to Rosecrans and was soon published. Its reception varied with the feelings and political opinions of those who read it. Lee followed it up by suggesting to Wade Hampton that, if he approved the letter, he get other Southern leaders to add their signatures and forward them to him or to General Rosecrans. And at Rosecrans's request, Lee gave him the names of some Southern generals residing in New York. Whether it was that the air was too heavily surcharged with politics, or whether it was that Lee was exhausted by his long nursing of Mildred, he did not enjoy the social life of the white so much as he had the previous summer. He tried to be enthusiastic about the place and the company, but he left early in September for the hot springs, and by September 14 was back home. He found at Lexington at least two more letters from Rosecrans, in which the northerner urged Lee to call public meetings throughout the South to ratify the white sulfur letter. With an eye to effective publicity, Rosecrans recommended that these gatherings be held at intervals so that the proceedings of all of them would find a place in the newspapers. He enclosed, also, a political program which had been drawn up by some of Seymour's advisers. In short, his old opponent of Sewell's Mountain was enthusiastically initiating Lee into the secrets of the campaign and was trying to make a politician of him. But Lee would have none of it. He felt that he had gone as far as he should in making a single exception to his rule of complete public silence on political questions, so he turned the letters over to General Eccles with the request that he ask Mr. Stewart to answer them. Eccles explained to Stewart that Lee did not desire to be connected any further, in any way, with the political questions or canvas of the day. Lee himself repeated this to Rosecrans. When I united with the gentleman, at the White Sulphur Springs, he said, in the reply to your letter addressed to me there, I went as far as I thought it was proper for me to do under the circumstances of the case, and did not intend to connect myself with the political questions of the country, or to depart from the course I had adopted on entering upon my present vocation. 
he had little time for outside activity, even if he had felt the inclination, for he was soon deep in the heavy work incident to the registration of the students and the reopening of the college on September 17. Attendance was not so large as during the previous session. The total enrollment for the session of 18681869 was 348 as against 410 the previous year. The decline, which was chiefly in students from Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky, probably reflected economic conditions and the improvement of institutions available nearer the homes of young men ready for college. As a whole, the students settled down to their work promptly enough, but the memory of the disturbances of the previous winter had not died in the minds of the military authorities. On November 19 Lee received a letter in which the commanding officer of the troops in Lexington advised him that the Negroes planned to have a meeting at the fairgrounds the next evening and were fearful that the students would interfere. The general had heard nothing of the proposed gathering. Neither had any of those with whom he talked. Nevertheless, he issued a warning. Stating his brief that the boys had no intention of troubling the Negroes, he requested that those who might be led by curiosity to go to the place of meeting would refrain from doing so. From past experience, he concluded, they may feel certain that, should any disturbance occur, efforts will be made to fix the blame on Washington College. It therefore behooves every student to keep away from all such assemblies. He wrote, also, to the commander of the federal garrison and told him he did not think the students proposed to obstruct the exercises. He added, everything, however, in our power will be done by the faculty as well as myself to prevent any students attending, and I heartily concur with you in the hope that the peace of the community may at all times be preserved. The meeting was held without interference. Not a student was there. It was the last time any charge was made that the students were conspiring against the free assembly of the Negroes. Except for a trip of two days to the fair at Staunton in October, Lee did not leave Lexington during the whole of the fall and winter. From the beginning of the session to the second week in April, 1869, he missed only one faculty meeting. In contrast to the hard, unhappy summer, it was a pleasant time, broken by the coming and going of kinspeople. The general's nephew, Edward Lee Child, journeyed over from Paris and was a welcome guest in October. Rooney and his wife, coming in November, were much entertained. The young Mrs. Lee had been coached by her husband in the ways of the family and had been told, in particular, that the general would expect her to be present punctually at family prayers, which were always held before breakfast. She met the test and had a perfect attendance, during a stay of three weeks, with not a single tardiness over which to blush. The general's estimate of her, already high, was raised by this tour de force. For her part, she confided to other members of the household that she did not believe even George Washington himself, if the father of his country had been laid at family prayers, would have the unqualified good opinion of General Lee. At Christmas, Robert arrived for a stay of two weeks, and all the girls were at home. Only Rooney, of the six children, was absent. It was the last time as many as five of them were together during Lee's lifetime. The general had much delight in their company. Christmas morning he had remembrances for them all, and for Mildred a pile of treasures. It developed that some time previously she had mentioned in his hearing the presents she wanted, and he had bought everything she had mentioned, instead of selecting one gift from the list. As the father of numerous daughters, he should have known better. However, the family historian did not record that the other Mrs. Lee were jealous at this show of partiality. Perhaps they regarded it as the crowning bit of spoiling to which Mildred was entitled because of her long illness. Robert and his father were much together during this visit. They frequently inspected the new president's house that was now nearing completion on the same ridge with the old residence. They rode out together, too, Leon Traveller and Robert on Lucy Long. The general's health for the time seemed excellent and his spirits were high. He also took me around with him visiting Robert Records and in the mild festivities of the neighbors he joined with evident pleasure. Shortly after the Christmas parties broke up, the last word was written in the treason proceedings that had been initiated almost four years before. President Davis had never been brought to trial because of legal difficulties that Chief Justice Chase saw in the way of the prosecution. 
The technical ground on which proceedings were halted was that Mr. Davis had been punished already under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which barred him from office, and that he could not be tried again for any act of war against the United States during the struggle with the South. This contention was embodied in a motion to quash the indictment, and on this the court divided. Chase was for sustaining the motion, Underwood was for denying it. On December 5, 1868, the division of the judges was certified to the Supreme Court of the United States. The General Amnesty Proclamation of December 25 followed in less than three weeks and of course operated to stop the prosecution of any former Confederate for treason. On February 15, 1869, the indictments against General Lee, Rooney, Custis, and Fitz Lee, 14 other general officers of the Confederacy, and 19 other persons, were null prost. Coming after the General Amnesty Proclamation, this formal dismissal of the indictments passed almost unnoticed. There is no reference to it, or to the December Amnesty Proclamation, in General Lee's correspondence. The outcome of the proceedings did not lead him to change in any respect the rule he had imposed upon himself to refrain from the public discussion of questions apt to arouse political or sectional antagonisms. Nor did the amnesty proclamation in a material way change Lee's status, though he could no longer be accounted a paroled prisoner of war. In one respect, the adoption of the Fourteenth Amendment offset the amnesty in that it barred him from state or federal office of any sort. As a soldier, he had taken oath to support the Constitution and, consequently, under the third paragraph of the new amendment, a two-thirds vote of Congress would be required to restore to him the right to hold office. When the new Constitution of the state was ratified and the test oath was eliminated, he could have qualified to vote, but he did not do so. He did not die disfranchised, in the strict sense of the word, nor as a paroled prisoner of war, often as this has been asserted, but he did end his days disbarred from office. The only effect of the amnesty proclamation on Lee was to make it possible for him to undertake the recovery of property seized at Arlington. The silver, as already noted, had been sent to Lexington and, after it had been dug up and cleaned, was in daily use. Through the efforts of Mrs. Britannia Kennan, virtually all the portraits at the Custis Mansion had been removed to Tudor Place, Georgetown, and after the war had been forwarded. The boat carrying them was sunk in the canal below Lexington, but when it was raised the pictures were salvaged and were restored so skillfully in Baltimore that they seemed undamaged. But the Washington relics had been left at Arlington in 1861. Some of them were stolen and carried away by individuals, as were the small personal belongings of the Lees, found in the house by marauding federal soldiers. When General McDowell took over Arlington as a federal post, the servant in charge told him of the depredations that had occurred. To save the remaining effects of Washington from theft and to safeguard them for Mrs. Lee, General McDowell removed them across the Potomac to the Department of the Interior. Placed on exhibit at the patent office, with the legend captured at Arlington, they constituted a rather pitiful display, a pair of candelabra, part of a set of china that Lafayette had given Mrs. Washington, a punch bowl, a looking glass, a washstand, a dressing bureau, a few of Washington's tent poles and pins, a little of his bed clothing and a pair of his breeches, with a waistcoat, nothing that had any value apart from its association with the first president. In the winter of 1868-1869, Captain James May, of Illinois, a longtime friend of the Lees, saw the relics, thought they should be returned, and consulted some of his friends in the administration. All of them agreed that it was proper to restore the articles to Mrs. Lee. The president had power to take this action, under existing law, and was sounded out. Although he declined to commit himself until the matter came before him in some definite form, Captain May was satisfied Johnson would not withhold his consent. Captain May accordingly wrote Mrs. Lee on February 9, 1869, suggesting that she apply for the relics. Mrs. Lee of course sought the counsel of the general, and he, knowing her natural interest in the property and believing that the return could be arranged without contention, approved of her proceeding as Captain May suggested. So she addressed a brief application to the president on February 10, under cover to Captain May. He delivered it to Secretary O. H. Browning of the Department of the Interior, who brought it to the president's attention at a cabinet meeting. The chief executive and all his advisers were unanimously for complying with Mrs. Lee's request, and the Secretary of the Interior was authorized to deliver the goods to Mrs. Lee upon proper identification. 
Mr. Browning communicated promptly with Lee, under date of February 24, whereupon the general replied that Mrs. Lee had designated Mrs. Beverly Kennan to identify the articles and to receipt for them. Browning was a native Kentuckian, though a staunch Republican and a resident of Illinois, and in antebellum days he had known the Lees. His part in facilitating the return of Mrs. Lee's property was personal and friendly. As there was no effort at concealment, the news of the prospective restoration of the relics was printed on February 26, 1869, in the Washington Evening Express. Unfortunately, it was erroneously stated that General Lee had made the application that the relics had been taken from the Arlington House, General Lee's estate, and that they were to be placed in the hands of some person deputized by the general to receive them. On the basis of this publication, General John A. Logan, of Illinois, introduced into the United States House of Representatives on March 1, 1869, a resolution calling on the Committee on Public Buildings and Grounds to ascertain by what right the Secretary of the Interior surrenders these articles so cherished as once the property of the father of his country to the rebel general-in-chief. Pending inquiry and report, the Secretary of the Interior was requested not to permit the delivery of the property. The radicals who controlled the House permitted no debate on the resolution, but rushed it through at once. The committee held a hurried hearing, with Captain May and Secretary Browning as the principal witnesses. On March 3, a few hours before Congress adjourned signed I, the committee reported a resolution that the Washington relics were the property of the United States and that any attempt on the part of the administration to deliver the same to the rebel General Robert E. Lee is an insult to the loyal people of the United States. The article should remain in the patent office, the resolution concluded, and should not be delivered to anyone without the consent of Congress. Thomas L. Jones of Kentucky offered a minority report, asserting that the articles were the property of Mrs. Lee, and that as they had been taken from Arlington without authority of the United States, and were of little value except as family heirlooms, they should be returned to her. Jones's attempt to discuss his recommendation was cut off by a call for the previous question. His resolution was then voted down, ayes, 34, nays, 92, not voting, 96. The majority resolution was thereupon passed, and the Kentuckian could do no more than print his remarks in the appendix to the Congressional Globe. General Lee must have felt keenly this action by Congress, but his observations upon it were brief. The relics were valuable to Mrs. Lee, he wrote, as having belonged to her great-grandmother and having been bequeathed to her by her father but as the country desires them, she must give them up. I hope their presence at the Capitol will keep in the remembrance of all Americans the principles and virtues of Washington. In a letter of thanks to Jones he said, it may be a question with some whether the retention of these articles is more an insult, in the language of the Committee on Public Buildings, to the loyal people of the United States than their restoration, but of this I am willing that they should be the judge, and since Congress has decided to keep them, Mrs. Lee must submit. He was even more philosophical about the property that had been carried away from Arlington by private persons. From what I have learned, said he, a great many things formerly belonging to General Washington, in the shape of books, furniture, camp equipage, etc., were carried away by individuals and are scattered over the land. I hope the possessors appreciate them and may imitate the example of their original owners, whose conduct must at times be brought to their recollection by these silent monitors. In this way, they will accomplish good to the country. A more serious matter occupying General Lee's attention that winter was the settlement of the Custis estate, of which he was still active executor. It will be remembered that Lee had liberated the slaves of his father-in-law during the winter of 1862-1863 when, despite the demands of the aftermath of the Fredericksburg campaign, he had found time to check the list of Negroes and to have the deed of manumission recorded in the Hustings Court of the city of Richmond. The other requirements of the will General Lee had not been able to carry out. Arlington, which had been sold for delinquent taxes on January 11, 1864, was now the property of the United States and had been set aside as a soldier's cemetery. The price paid was $26,860, but money was merely transferred from one government account to another. The four-mile tract had similarly passed out of the hands of the family. At the end of the war, General Lee had been of opinion that Smith's Island had shared the fate of Arlington and the four-mile property. He therefore considered that the only realty left to the estate was Roman Coke, which Mr. Custis had left to Robert, and the White House, which had been bequeathed to Rooney. 
Each of these farms contained 4,000 acres and, it will be recalled, had been given subject to the condition that if the sale of certain other real estate and the labor of the slaves did not yield enough to pay the legacies to the granddaughters, these two farms were to be worked and part of the proceeds set aside until the full amount of $40,000 had been realized. It was an odd situation. Two of the sons were in possession of their full share of the estate thanks to the fact that the land left them had been within the Confederate lines, but Custis had been deprived of virtually the whole of his prospective inheritance by the tax sales, and the daughters, it then appeared, had no prospect of receiving the cash bequests their grandfather had devised for them. General Lee's first impulse after the war had been to wait, trusting that his civil rights would be restored and that he could proceed to clear the estate, though, meantime, he asked a friendly attorney to investigate the case. As the prospect of a pardon faded out, he still hoped that he might redeem Arlington, which he assumed the government had sold in the belief that the estate was his. I should have thought, he told a northern friend, that the use of the grounds, the large amount of wood on the place, the teams, etc., and the sale of the furniture of the house, would have been sufficient to have paid the taxes. I do not know whether the Secretary of War would relinquish possession of the estate or permit its redemption under the Virginia laws. If he did, and should require $26,860 stated to have been bid for it by the United States, to be refunded, it would be out of my power to redeem it. In the circumstances, Lee could do nothing to prevent the award to the government of a tax sale title, which was allowed on September 26, 1866. That same year General Lee told Robert to regard Roman Coke as his own, subject to such a charge as might be necessary to make up the bequests to the Mrs. Lee. The general felt that deduction in the amount of these gifts should be made in view of the shrinkage of the estate. A similar understanding doubtless was reached with Rooney. Lee had strong attachment to the soil and thought he did not complain because the misfortunes of war had fallen heavily on his wife and children, he had lasting interest in the old properties and a deep love for them. In April, 1866, someone in New York had tried to sell him a painting of the White House as it had been before the Federals burned it. Lee replied that he was unable to purchase works of art. He added, the White House of Pamunkey, as it lives in my memory, must suffice for my purposes. To a woman who sent him photographs of a painting of Stratford, he wrote, your picture recalls scenes of my earliest recollection and happiest days. Though unseen for years, every feature of the house is familiar to me. Cherishing these feelings, he was only deterred from an active effort to recover Arlington by his failure to find any practical means of attaining his result, though there was a general feeling in the spring of 1868 that the property would be returned. In January, 1869, J.S. Black of Washington, a lawyer and publicist of high position, volunteered his services in proceedings for the restoration of the former Custis property. The case demanded abilities as distinguished as those of Black, because in addition to the involvements of the tax sale, there were prospective complications owing to the fact that Custis Lee had not taken, and did not propose to take, his grandfather's name in arms, as required under the Custis will. Lee acknowledged and accepted Mr. Black's offer with a hearty, I thank you. He explained that he had no personal property interest in Arlington and that his desire simply was to turn it over to the rightful heir. I have not as yet taken any steps in the matter, he wrote Black, under the belief that I could accomplish no good, nor do I wish to do so, unless in your opinion some benefit would result from it. He was willing to go to law for Mrs. Lee's and Custis's sake, but he did not wish to enter into litigation that would arouse dark passions to no good purpose. Meantime, it was discovered that though Smith's Island had been sold for delinquent taxes on June 15, 1864, it could be recovered under Virginia law. Action was accordingly instituted, and on April 23, 1868, the court returned the property to the Custis estate. Rooney became interested in this land, which the general was anxious to make productive for the estate. The place contained 4,038 acres, was in the Atlantic, off Cape Charles, and had never appeared to Lee to be so valuable as Mr. Custis had thought it was. Lee now suggested that Rooney and Robert visit the island and devise some plan for its use or disposition. Whatever they recommended, he would approve. They might find it desirable, he said, to buy the freehold themselves. Rooney went there and found that, except for the small government reservation and lighthouse, the property had been much neglected and misused. Wild cattle were roving over it, and its value was declining. 
Good business dictated that unless a better offer could be had, the two sons should take the island in hand and should make what they could from it. I should like this whole matter arranged as soon as possible, the general concluded, for my life is very uncertain and its settlement now may avoid future difficulties. A friendly agent, Hamilton S. Neal, accordingly advertised the property and on December 22, 1868, receiving no higher bid, sold it for $9,000 to W. H. F. N. R. E. Lee, Jr. The general tipped the note of his sons for the principal, payable without interest in 13 years. From his own funds he took an equivalent amount and transferred it to his daughters, as part of the legacy due from their grandfather's estate. This was invested for them in railroad bonds. To raise the money with which to pay the Mrs. Lee he evidently had to sell a sizable block of securities, for soon after making the settlement he reinvested something more than $8,000 of his own funds. The net result of the sale of the island to his sons was that the daughters received a third of their legacy, the boys got the island and the general lost the interest on $9,000. With the sale of Smith's Island, General Lee had proceeded as far as he could in settlement of the estate. Nothing more could be done about Arlington or about the Formile Tract, though, as late as the summer of 1870, hopes were maintained and a conference with his lawyer was held by General Lee. The family, of course, had never been able to live after the beginning of the war as it had lived in the sumptuous, earlier years. Simplicity had been a virtue during the days of the Confederacy, thereafter it was a necessity. When the Confederacy fell, $20,000 of Lee's securities, about one-fourth of his estate, became worthless. The family had only the interest on his other investments, which yielded not more than $3,600 a year. During the months immediately after the surrender he may not have been able to collect on that basis. For the first year of his presidency, living had been most spartan, with no luxuries and little travel. Parents and children had taken their condition philosophically. They made no pretenses when they went abroad and they offered no excuses when they entertained friends at plain dinners. Lee was fond of elegance of every sort, fine houses, furniture, plate, clothing, ornaments, horses, equipage, wrote a young assistant who observed him closely during his presidency. But he could and did deny himself and his family the enjoyment of such things when he did not have the money to buy them. I have seen him in garments which many men of smaller income and far less reputation would have been unwilling to wear. He impressed these ideas and habits on his family. Mrs. Lee's usual occupation in the dining room, during the evenings was mending her husband's and son's underclothing. I met one of his daughters at a railway station. She had a basket of very fine pears, on the beauty of which I commented. Yes, she said, they are nice and I would offer you one, but I have just enough for my dessert tomorrow. She then laughed and said, I want this inscribed on my tombstone. Although on pleasure she was bent. She had a frugal mind. After the first session at Lexington the increase in General Lee's salary from $1,500 to $3,000, plus his share of tuition fees, of course relieved his finances somewhat. For 18661867, the college paid him a total of $4,756, but he did not change the style of his living. The only difference was in his provision of more extensive summer vacations for his family. He was able, also, to offer financial help to Robert in stocking his farm and in building a new house, though he stated downrightly that the money he might lend Robert for the erection of a better residence would be taken from the sum he was putting aside for the purchase of a home for Mrs. Lee. Robert declined to touch this fund. Speaking generally, and for the whole of General Lee's life, the dollar mark was a symbol that occurred seldom in his correspondence. So large a household, with fortunes so changeful, had its financial problems, of course, but it was not dominated or depressed by them. The general had a horror of debt and he prudently avoided it by living within his income, however small it was. Nothing is more impressive, in the intimate annals of the family, than the absence of complaints about hard living or lack of money. They were frank in their family conversation. The general teased all his daughters. Jesting among themselves of many things, they wrote one another reams about the details of marriages, visits, and journeyings, for all of them except Custis were strongly social in nature. But money was a theme they tacitly avoided. The repeated business offers that came to him seemed to have awakened no yearnings. 
nothing appears in his correspondence to show any desire on the part of any member of the family that he accept the post of supervisor of agencies of the Knickerbocker Life Insurance Company, a position pressed on him in the winter of 1868-1869 at the then-dazzling salary of $10,000. Not a flutter was aroused in the president's house, so far as one may now judge, by rumors that he might be named president of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. When he rejected a subsequent proposal that he removed to New York and, at a large salary, represent Southern Commerce's girls did not even hint that life in New York would be interesting. The household was content to live modestly and to share the hardships of the time, and Lee himself was even more determined than before 1861 to save all he could. For the protection of his wife and daughters he spent no more than necessity and duty claimed of him. He was successful in his thrift and invested wisely in good securities. Never so poor a man as he was supposed to be after the war, he died worth some $88,000, not counting the $20,500 he had put into Southern wartime issues or the $4,000 he had in bonds of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Company. Chapter 22 The General Revisits Familiar Scenes To only one business enterprise, during the whole of his residence in Lexington, did General Lee give his active support. That was to the Valley Railroad Company. And then he was induced to participate, not for financial benefit to himself, but because he thought the undertaking would help the college and the town. Lexington was without railroad connection. The nearest station was Goshen, on the Chesapeake in Ohio, 23 miles distant, over a nightmare of a road. As an alternative, the traveler had nothing except the James River and Kanawha Canal, along which the canal boat crept for 12 hours to Lynchburg, 50 miles away. Lexington people were divided in the opinion as to which route was the worse. Once, when asked by a visitor to recommend the best way from Lexington to the outer world, Lee replied, it makes but little difference, for whichever route you select, you will wish you had taken the other. Lexington had long dreamed of a railroad up the Shenandoah Valley, and after the close of the war actively agitated it. The Baltimore and Ohio, which was interested in the possibilities of the territory, had Colonel James Randolph make a survey in 1866 from Harrisonburg, Rockingham County, southward to Salem, Roanoke County. North of Harrisonburg, there already were two stretches of railroad that could easily be joined together and connected with the main line of the Baltimore and Ohio. At Salem, the Virginia Tennessee, now the Norfolk and Western, would be reached. Valley people argued that the construction of a railway from Mount Jackson to Salem, southward by Harrisonburg, Staunton, and Lexington, would open a new and useful north and south route. The counties along the proposed line were willing, despite their poverty, to market $1,200,000 of securities and to subscribe the proceeds to stock of the corporation. For the purchase of a railroad bond issue, sufficient to cover the rest of the construction cost, the promoters looked hopefully to Baltimore, Maryland, a sympathetic city enriched by the war and linked already with the Shenandoah Valley by the ties of trade. The leaders of the enterprise arranged, at length, to appear before the businessmen and council of that city and to present the project formally. They appealed insistently to General Lee to accept them. He had been suffering from a cold that had kept him indoors for a week, his duties at home and at the college were heavy, and he did not feel he was suited for this sort of undertaking, but he was so importuned that he thought it would appear ill-mannered and unkind to refuse. So, on April 20, 1869, he set out for Baltimore with a delegation that included most of the notables of that part of Virginia. They reached Baltimore on the evening of April 21 and were received with much cordiality. General Lee went to the home of Samuel Taggart, a friend he had met at the White Sulphur. Most of the delegates, of whom there were ten from General Lee's county alone, stopped at the Utah House, at Fayette and Utah Streets. Inevitably, the visit took on something of a public nature. Aside from those who were curious to see a celebrity, numerous Lee and Custis kinsfolk resided in Baltimore, as did many friends who had been cherished since the days of his residence there in 1849-1852. All of them wanted to greet the general again and many of them attended a reception given in his honor by the Taggarts. Lee was anxious, if possible, to avoid a public appearance and to escape all speech-making, and he asked if he might not be excused from attending the gathering of businessmen and merchants, which was to be one of the main events of the visit. His request was referred to John W. Garrett, president of the Baltimore and Ohio, whose of operation was more essential to the success of the enterprise than that of anyone else. 
Mr. Garrett, doubtless realizing that Lee's presence would attract many who would not come otherwise, urged that the general be at the meeting. On the morning of April 22, the delegation organized by electing General Lee chairman. The mayor and councilmen were introduced, and arrangements were made for two gatherings the next day. Another Virginia delegation, which was urging an extension of the Alexandria, Orange and Virginia roads southward from Lynchburg to Danville, was due a hearing that day, also, and had arrived before the spokesman for the Shenandoah. When Lee entered with Albert Schumacher and the members of the reception committee, he was welcomed with hand-clapping and cheers and was given a seat facing the president's chair. The meeting was duly opened, the visitors were assured a friendly hearing, and General Lee was called upon but he did not make a speech. Instead, he simply announced that Colonel M. G. Harmon, president of the Valley Railroad, would address the meeting in behalf of that line. Colonel Harmon spoke, the merchants voted a resolution of endorsement, the other committee was heard, its appeal to the city council was similarly approved, and the meeting adjourned. The Baltimore hosts, regardless of their political view, greeted Lee and the Virginians with much cordiality and escorted the general from the room. Just nine years before, on that very day, and almost at that very hour, Lee had been ushered out of another crowded hall, in the excited city of Richmond, where he had been given command of the Virginia forces. That afternoon at four o'clock, the delegation appeared before the city council, convened for the purpose in the Western Female High School, on Fayette Street, between Paca and Green. Admission was by card, but the building was jammed with an interested audience, of whom a fourth were women. Before this assemblage General Lee had to endure the ordeal of a laudatory introduction, an ordeal he always faced without moving a muscle or showing the least touch of emotion, although inwardly he writhed. When the eulogium was ended, the general read a memorial which he had prepared with care before he left Lexington. If the reading was to be accounted a speech, it was much the longest General Lee ever made. The formal presentation of this paper being the only business before the meeting, the councilman who had introduced the general obligingly announced that opportunity would be given for the ladies to meet him by crossing the platform on which he stood. Then began a grueling half-hour, the worst, no doubt, that Lee had passed since Appomattox itself. He shook hands with each of the ladies cordially, but he had to listen to all their compliments, and by many of them he was saluted with a kiss. Fond as he was of the company of women, he would have preferred not to meet them in cohorts. The end of the line was reached, at last, however, and Mayor Banks escorted Lee to the street, where another throng greeted him with high huzzas. Cheers did not build railroads. The delegates have had a pleasant time in Baltimore, said the hostile American, and will probably go away with plenty of fair promises, of which those made upon the part of the council are not likely to be fulfilled, certainly not until the bank ceased to protest the notes of the city, and it has some money in its treasury. A later article in the same paper was even more critical, the affair was a very successful one if regarded simply as an ovation in honor of General Robert E. Lee, but as a business operation it has been a conspicuous failure. The general of the late, so-called, Southern Confederacy has been faded and smiled upon, and banquet, toasted and hurrahed over to an extent that would have satisfied even Andrew Johnson, and as Mr. Lee has a reputation for personal modesty, must have greatly disgusted him. In fact, the whole demonstration was in every particular feature a social and political rather than a business operation. There were crowds everywhere, but they were sympathizers with the chief of the late rebellion, and not subscribers to Virginia railroads, they bestowed cheers liberally, but will button their pockets tightly when the demand for actual aid is made. The paper went on to argue that Baltimore was not financially in condition to subscribe, and that if she were, Virginia as yet gave no assurance that the investment would be secure. General Lee remained in Baltimore a few days after the hearing in order to attend the further meetings of the Virginia Committee. Besides, there were friends whom he wished to see, and, in addition, a particular mission he had to perform, he wanted to purchase Mrs. Lee a small carriage, in which she could be placed easily and driven comfortably. He found what he desired and wrote her of it with manifest pleasure. On Sunday, April 25, he went with his host to St. Paul's Episcopal Church, on the corner of St. Paul and Saratoga Streets. Word of his presence in the church spread about that part of the town and brought a great crowd to the door. When he left the building, at the close of the service, all hats were off and he had to walk for a long distance between lines of sympathizing people. On Wednesday, April 28, he journeyed out to the country place of his cousin, Mrs. Samuel George, near Ellicott City. 
Thence he went for a short visit at the nearby home of Washington Peter, a first cousin of Mrs. Lee's and also his own intimate friend. Before he left for this visit, Rev. John Laburn called and, in the name of Cyrus H. McCormick, invited Lee to New York to see the inventor. Dr. Laburn pointed out the advantages to the college from a closer relationship with Mr. McCormick and argued so persuasively that though Lee was anxious to return to Lexington, he agreed to defer a decision until he had been to see Mr. Peter. When the general reached Baltimore again, Dr. Laburn called to hear his decision. Lee told him that he was grateful for Mr. McCormick's invitation but could not then attempt the journey. I think I see, General, said Laban, that the real difficulty lies in your shrinking from the conspicuity of a visit to New York. I can readily understand that this would be unpleasant. But you need not be exposed to any publicity whatever, my friend has given me carte blanche to make all arrangements for your coming. I will engage a compartment in the palace car of the night train, and will telegraph my friend to meet you with his carriage on your arrival in New York. Lee replied quickly and with deep feeling, Oh, doctor, I couldn't go sneaking into New York in that way. When I go there, I'll go in daylight and go like a man. Laban, of course, had no answer to this and accepted Lee's refusal as final. But the interview did not end there. The minister was a very interesting man, a very able one, a native of Lexington, long a pastor in the north. He had gone south during the war and after its close had moved to Baltimore, where he had charge of an independent Presbyterian church. Feeling that Laban could be trusted and might be able to help the South, Lee continued the conversation and described some of the conditions in the South. He told how the Confederate states had lost much of their best blood. The North had sent some of its finest youths to the front but had been able to draw so heavily from the immigrant population and from the slums of the city that its losses had not been proportionately so great. Then the conversation turned to the attitude of the Northern press. Lee expressed his regret that Northern newspapers continued to assert that the object of the war had been to perpetuate slavery. On this point, wrote Dr. Laburn in a subsequent report of the interview, he seemed not only indignant but hurt. He said it was not true. He declared that, for himself, he had emancipated most of his slaves years before the war and had sent to Liberia those that were willing to go, that the latter were writing back most affectionate letters to him, some of which he received through the lines during the war. He said, also, as an evidence that the colored people did not consider him hostile to their race, that during this visit to Baltimore some of them who had known him when he was stationed there had come up in the most affectionate manner and put their hands into the carriage window to shake hands with him. They would hardly have received him in this way, he thought, had they looked upon him as fresh from a war intended for their oppression and injury. So far, said Lee, from engaging in a war to perpetuate slavery, I am rejoiced that slavery is abolished. I believe it will be greatly for the interests of the South. So fully am I satisfied of this, as regards Virginia especially, that I would cheerfully have lost all I have lost by the war, and have suffered all I have suffered, to have this object attained. Again, he spoke of the misrepresentation of the South by Northern writers, and said, Doctor, I think some of you gentlemen that use the pen should see that justice is done us. The conversation was ended only when Rooney Lee, who had just arrived in Baltimore, entered the room. Lee's pleasant stay in Baltimore came to a close on May 1, when he traveled with Mr. and Mrs. Taggart to Washington in order to pay his respects to President Grant. This was done on suggestion from the White House. It had been proposed to Lee the previous winter that he invite General Grant to Lexington, doubtless because a visit from the president-elect and a meeting between the two adversaries would win favorable publicity for the college. General Lee had declined. I should be very glad if General Grant would visit Washington College when I would endeavor to treat him with the courtesy and respect due the President of the United States. But if I were to invite him to do so, it might not be agreeable to him and I fear, at this time, my motives might be misunderstood, both by himself and others, and that evil would result, instead of good. I will, however, bear your suggestion in mind, and, should a favorable opportunity offer, will be glad to take advantage of it. Now that he knew Grant desired to see him, he went without any questionings and without any loss of equanimity. He had no apologies to make and felt no embarrassment in meeting again the man to whom he had surrendered. Appomattox had put no stigma on his soul. 
We failed, he wrote an old friend, not long before he called on Grant, we failed, but in the good providence of God apparent failure often proves a blessing. It was in the spirit, accompanied by Mr. and Mrs. Taggart, that he drove to the White House about eleven o'clock and modestly introduced himself to Robert M. Douglas, Grant's secretary. John Lothrop Motley, the historian and diplomatist, was closeted with the president at the time, but he retired immediately. Grant and Lee shook hands and Grant presented his young secretary, who was a son of Stephen A. Douglas. The meeting was unceremonious and in keeping with the character of the two men, but Douglas saw it revived memories that saddened both of them. Word of the expected call had leaked out, and rumor had it that the two were to discuss the policy the government was following in the South. This was a wrong impression, of course, but as there exists no full account of the interview by an eyewitness or participant, the exact range of the conversation can only be surmised. It probably consisted only of a brief social exchange, with casual reference to the reasons for Lee's visit to Baltimore. In fifteen minutes, the two shook hands again and Lee left, to meet Grant no more. Bidding farewell to the friendly Taggarts, the general went to the home of Mrs. Britannia Kennan on Georgetown Heights. He dined once with Mrs. Podstad, a kinswoman, wife of the secretary of the Spanish legation, and spent Sunday quietly with Mrs. Kennan. On Monday, May 3rd, or Tuesday, May 4th, the general went by steamer from Washington to Alexandria. He had passed through the city of his boyhood days on several occasions after the war, but he had never set foot on her streets from the time he left for Richmond in 1861 until he came ashore that day at the boat landing on his homeward journey from Baltimore and started to walk to the townhouse of Mrs. A. M. Fitzhugh of Ravensworth, widow of Mrs. Lee's maternal uncle. Recognized and warmly greeted as he went along, he found it Mrs. Fitzhugh's sister-in-law, Mrs. Sidney Smith Lee, and his nephew Fitz, of the cavalry. His brother Sidney soon came up from his farm on the Potomac to meet him. It was the first time they had been together since they had left Richmond after the close of the war. Then followed three happy days. General Lee loved Alexandria. There is no community, he said, to which my affections more strongly cling than that of Alexandria, composed of my earliest and oldest friends, my kind schoolfellows, and faithful neighbors. The townspeople had equal regard for him, and when they heard that he was there, they began to call on him in such numbers that they almost swamped Mrs. Fitzhugh's house, which was located on the east side of Washington Street, near the corner of Queen. It became necessary to arrange a reception at a local hotel, Green's Mansion House, on the southeast corner of Cameron and Fairfax Streets. Thither General Lee went on foot, the distance was only five squares, a little before eight o'clock, on the evening of May 4th, accompanied by two or three of his old personal friends. There were no flowers, no music, no ceremony. No announcement of the reception had been published, and no invitations had been sent out. The men who had walked with him from Mrs. Fitzhugh simply arranged for the callers to file past the general as he stood in the hotel parlor. M.D. Course, an Alexandrian who had commanded one of the brigades in Pickett's division, introduced those who had never met Lee. Half the town came to greet him. For more than two hours the line was unbroken, old people who remembered his boyhood in the city and still called him Robert, women whom he had known in his childhood, grizzling men who had been his schoolmates, hundreds who had followed him into battle, young mothers with their infants, girls who looked adoringly into his face and put up their cheeks to be kissed, boys who shook his hand shyly but never forgot that distinction to the end of their days, people of contrary political faith. Republicans, carpetbaggers, scalawags who wished to see the chief of rebels, even a former slave from Arlington who was overjoyed to salute his one-time master. The callers must have numbered two or three thousand, and some of them, old acquaintances, were much changed. The war had not come visibly to spread fire and to shatter houses in the kindly old town, but it had bent shoulders and saddened hearts. The shadow of empty Arlington lay over all. Still, it was sweet to hear again the dear, remembered names, to see that courage had not vanished, and to know that hope was not dead. Wherever he went on the street there was a joyful and sometimes a dramatic or amusing meeting. When he approached a corner a fat four-year-old boy stumbled and fell at the curbstone as he ran to the general. Whose little boy was coming to see me? Lee asked of him as he picked up the little fellow. I am Robert E. Lee Johnston, replied the youngster proudly. And this is my little godson, the general said as he kissed him. 
Soon afterwards he heard a voice calling, Moss Robert, Moss Robert. Turning, he saw an old mulatto woman hurrying to him. I am Eugenia, she said, when she came up, one of the Arlington slaves. Lee shook hands warmly. I wonder if you would not like to have my picture, Eugenia, he asked when they had talked for a few minutes. Deed I would, Moss Robert, she answered, and in due time received it by mail. Lee spent a night and part of a day at Mrs. Fitzhugh's and had a meeting with the Venerable John Janney, who had presided over the Virginia Convention when Lee had been made commander of the Virginia forces. These and other activities in the town were followed by a visit to the general's cousin, Cassius F. Lee, on Seminary Hill. He remained there for a night, called on Bishop Johns the next day and saw General Samuel Cooper again, a tragic figure now, an aristocrat in every impulse, brought down in fortune by the losses of the war. That evening, May 6, being Ascension Day, General Lee attended service at Christ Church, accompanied by his brother, Sidney Smith Lee. It was the last time the two ever knelt together. He completed a dizzy 24 hours with a reception at the home of J. B. Dangerfield, where he had the pleasure of seeing still again some of his oldest personal friends. Here, as everywhere else during the Alexandria visit, the cordiality of the general's greeting was particularly remarked. He was at home and free of the reserve that sometimes was hard to distinguish from diffidence. The only distasteful personal incident of the visit, so far as is known, was the manner in which a reporter of the New York Herald dogged Lee for an interview, first in Baltimore and then in Alexandria. He finally got into the general's presence, but Lee received him standing and refused to talk. I shall be glad to see you as a friend, he said, but request that the visit may not be made in your professional capacity. Lee never talked to newspaper men and, if he could avoid it, never permitted himself to be quoted in the press. He had been libeled often in the North, and in the South he had suffered many things during the war at the hands of editorial strategists. On the morning of May 7, the general left for home by the Orange, Alexandria and Manassas Railroad and arrived on the 8th, after an absence of 18 days. From Staunton he brought Miss Peyton and his daughter Agnes over to Lexington with him. Had he enjoyed his visit? His family inquired. Very much, he answered, but they would make too much fuss over an old rebel. More deliberately, he wrote Rooney, I had, upon the whole, a pleasant visit and was particularly glad to see again our old friends and neighbors in Alexandria and vicinity, though I should have preferred to enjoy their company in a more quiet way. When one of his daughters protested that his hat was becoming disreputable, he replied half grimly, half jokingly, you don't like this hat? Why, I have seen a whole city full come out to admire it. Scarcely was the general at home before he felt compelled to leave once more. The Lexington Church had again named him as delegate to the council, which met that year in Fredericksburg, and though examinations were now close at hand, he did not think he should decline. He doubtless made the trip down the Chesapeake and Ohio to Hanover Junction and thence up the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac to Fredericksburg. Word of his coming had spread. The brave little city turned out to do him honor. Although it was nearly midnight when his train arrived, the station was jammed, and as the moon was shining brightly, the people easily recognized the general. Instantly they raised the rebel yell as it had not been heard there since Sedgwick, in May, 1863, had been driven back across the Rappahannock. A new barouche was in waiting to carry the general quickly to the home of his host, Major Thomas Barton. Late as it was when he got there, Fredericksburg had no intention of letting his first hour in the town pass unobserved, the Veterans Band of the 30th Virginia Regiment, Corses Brigade, Pickett's Division, the very name Awakening Echoes, turned out and serenaded him royally, before one o'clock. The general did not respond with a speech, after the way of politicians, but he sent out his thanks to the musicians, and Major Barton presented them with a bottle of something wherewith to console themselves for the general's silence. It was noticeable that in the welcoming crowds the Negroes were as enthusiastic as Lee's own veterans. A committee of the town's leading men called on the general the next day, when the council was due to open, and asked him if he would consent to hold a reception at the Exchange Hotel, in order that the people of the town might greet him. He declined. Having come to Fredericksburg to attend a religious meeting, he said, he did not think he should make any personal appearance. He would, he added, of course be glad to see any of his friends who called on him privately. 
The people respected the general's wishes and allowed him to attend quietly the sessions of the council. The whole town chuckled, however, at the performance of a new settler, a northern man, who wanted to see General Lee and had his own ideas of etiquette. He did not know General Lee's host and would not enter the Barton house unbidden, so he rode up with his wife and child and sent in a request that the general would come out and see him. Lee left the house, walked down to the street, and greeted the trio in the vehicle. As usual, the general took no part in the debate of the council, though he was a member of the Committee on the State of the Church and of the Committee on Clerical Support. He was not present at the session when the council debated the admission of delegates from a colored church, but he was understood to concur heartily in the decision that the representatives should be seated. From Fredericksburg, after the council ended on May 29, the general went to Richland, on the Potomac, and paid a two-day visit to his brother and intimate, Sidney Smith Lee, whom he had recently seen in Alexandria. Hurrying back, he reached late in the night of June 1 in time to attend the final examinations. He was rushing about faster than his heart would stand, but he made no complaint and, for the time, felt no ill effects. He returned in time for an event to which the family had long been looking forward, the new home, the president's house, as General Lee always styled it to avoid the impression that it was his own, at last, after many delays on account of the college's lack of funds, was finished and ready for occupancy. Before going to Fredericksburg, the general had arranged all the details of the final cleaning and preparation. On his return, he had only to move in. The house had cost something more than the $15,000 originally appropriated for it. A two-story building, with a wide center hall, it was very comfortable, though not architecturally impressive. Mrs. Lee's bedroom was on the first floor, so that she could go directly to the porch. Much to Lee's satisfaction, a commodious brick stable for traveler adjoined residents. It was gratifying, he said, to be under the same roof with his old friend. Other convenient outbuildings and a small greenhouse were included. Water from a large cistern was pumped to a tank under the roof, whence it was distributed by gravity to the rooms below. The house was occupied by General for only 16 months and a half, and, except for the somber fact that he died there, it has fewer associations with him than is possessed by the old president's house, the next residence on the hill. Although he manifestly was much interested in the new place, he certainly did not approve so large an outlay by the college, or any luxuries for himself, modest though they were. He probably had much less to do with the design and construction than has been generally supposed. His hand is most to be seen in the ample veranda on three sides of the building, silent evidence, after sixty years, of his thought for Mrs. Lee's comfort in her invalidism. It was a place of pleasantness to the Lees. They had more space, larger convenience, and room for every member of the family. The general soon found the spot he liked best, the space in front of the large windows in the dining room, whence he could look across the campus and, in the other direction, over the fields to the mountains that always delighted his eyes. The first impulse of the family was to share their new home with those friends whose hospitality they had not always been able to return in their first Lexington home. Invitations to their girlfriends must have flowed freely from the pens of the Mrs. Lee. Shortly after commencement, Lee listed six young women guests, all in the house, with others out of it. He added to Rooney, as one married man to another, the young ladies are so much engaged with the collegiates that Custis and I see but little of them, but, Robert, could compete with the yearlings, which we cannot. One young friend there was whom Lee doubtless wished his daughters might entertain, the brilliant Norval Kasky, to whom had come both happiness and sorrow, a sharp and sudden sorrow. In the late summer of 1868 her father, James H. Kasky, had died. When his affairs were settled it was discovered that he had met with ruinous losses and that his fortune, which had been large for his day, had been wiped out. Nothing was left for the invalid widow or for Norvell, the only child, who had just become engaged to a sudden Jones of Orange County. General Lee knew all these facts and grieved over the distress of Norvell and her mother. He rejoiced that she had found love, but he must have wondered how Norvell would fare on a lonely farm, she who had always lived in ease in a city home of rich culture. He wrote her this letter. Lexington, Virginia, 14 Janie. 1869. My dear Miss Norvell. 
As the day of your nuptials approaches my thoughts revert to you more often and intensely, and I recall the manifold kindnesses of your dear father and mother, and the affectionate consideration of yourself with increasing gratitude and pleasure. Your future happiness is therefore I assure you a matter of deep concern to me, and this most important event in your life one of great interest. May it prove as happy as I sincerely wish it, may the blessing of kind heaven accompany you throughout your course on earth, and may a merciful providence shield you from all evil and lead you at the end to everlasting joy and peace. Hoping that you will not forget us, but will sometimes give us the pleasure of your company. I am with true affection. Your constant friend. R. E. Lee. Miss Norvell Kasky 47. The hospitality that Lee would gladly have shared with this fine girl was unostentatious, though occasionally he would serve wine that had somehow survived all the vicissitudes of the family since the days of Light Horse Harry. The general himself participated in the entertainment of virtually all the guests and, his admirers observed, was able to adapt himself to any company. Even when a deaf old man called in the spring of 1869, the general was not outdone. He took a seat close to his visitor and devoted himself so patiently to conversation that the gentleman went away in high delight. If his house guests were girls, Lee always had a gentle raillery and gallant attentions for them, and if they were students from the college, he would sometimes sit for long evenings with them when the ladies were away and would talk of everything except the war. One frequent caller from among Lee's boys remembered that the general referred only once to the unhappy struggle and then merely asked to what command the youth had belonged. The boy answered that he had enlisted in a P. Hill's old regiment and then in the Black Horse Troop. Lee remarked that both had excellent records in the war and changed the subject. If Lee's guests were men, he gave them as much of his time as he could, looked closely after their comfort, and even blacked their boots himself when they left them at their door, thinking a servant would clean them. He usually did the marketing for the household and was often to be seen with his basket on his arm. Never would he carry an umbrella on this or any other errand, even in the roughest weather. Scorn of such shelter was one mark of the soldier that he could not yield. It was in dealing with his own family that the deep affection of Lee's nature and his social graces most beautifully were displayed. Once, wrote a former student of the college, I was at the Lee home on the general's birthday and was sitting with him when his son, General Custis Lee, entered the room. Memory of that meeting can never be effaced, the stately yet gracious greeting of the son and father, the familiar and fond aspiration that he might enjoy many happy returns of the day brought tears to my eyes and brings them still. Mrs. Preston, presenting the feminine point of view, recorded, his tenderness to his children, especially his daughters, was mingled with a delicate courtesy which belonged to an older day than ours, a courtesy which recalls the per chevalier of nightly times. He had a pretty way of addressing his daughters, in the presence of other people, with a prefix which would seem to belong to the age of lace ruffles and side swords. Where is my little Miss Mildred, he would say on coming in from his ride or walk at dusk. She is my light bearer, the house is never dark if she is in it. Toward Mrs. Lee his manner was always cheerful and affectionate, mingled now and then with a gentle jest or a polite dissent as her conversation justified. One day he was pacing the floor while Mrs. Lee was talking with a former student, himself an ex-soldier, on the vast difference between the ragged uniforms of the Confederates and the fine equipment of the Federals. The general paused for a moment, his eyes lighting up, and at the conclusion of her remark said, as he inclined forward with that superb grace, but, ah. Mistress Lee, we gave them some awful hard knocks, with all our rags. Lee always claimed the honor of wheeling his wife into the dining room for meals, and frequently in the evening, as she sat knitting or mending, he would read aloud to her and to his daughters. His own reading was not wide during the years he was at Lexington. Having myself no library and those which were here having been scattered and broken up, as he wrote one inquirer, he could not consult even familiar books on the history of Virginia or of the American Revolution. He made some researches while preparing the introduction to a new edition of his father's memoirs, and he used a few printed authorities when writing his letter to Acton. In the spring of 1869 either he or some member of his family studied French history rather extensively. As already noted, he read and enjoyed Worsley's translation of the Iliad, which was sent him by the author. For the rest, he held principally to the two books that were his companions for more than twenty years, Holy Writ and the Protestant Episcopal Prayer Book. 
there was no pretense about his reading. Some books he did not intend to peruse and frankly said so. Works on the war he purposely left alone. When David McRae, a Scotch visitor, repeated a story that Lee and Grant had both read the proofs of a current history of the war, Lee immediately denied it for himself. He had never read a history of the war, he told McRae, or the biography of anyone engaged in it. My own life has been written, he said, but I have not looked into it. I do not wish to awaken memories of the past. Outside his home, as in it, General Lee felt his social obligations, and without the least touch of the Grand Seigneur, he showed courtesies to virtually all those who came to Lexington. Besides calling on strangers or parents visiting their sons at college, he often went to see the sick of the town, a lad with a broken leg as surely as one of his own professors. Regard for the ill was a part of his daily life, in the snows of winter and when the students were packing their trunks to go home. As the session of 18681869 closed, a wordy, angry campaign was being conducted over the new state constitution that had been drawn by a motley convention as one of the conditions of Virginia's readmission to the Union. Radicals and Negroes had controlled the convention and, after much wrangling, had drafted a document that provided universal suffrage and in almost the same clause disfranchised thousands of Confederates by paraphrasing the language of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. No person could vote or hold office in Virginia who had been a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president or vice president, or who held any office, civil or military, under the United States, or under any state, who having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. A three-fifths vote of the legislature was necessary to remove these disabilities. In addition, before any man could take office, the Constitution stipulated that he must subscribe to a test oath to the effect that he had not voluntarily aided the Confederacy or held office under it. These provisions were far milder than those the extreme radicals had originally adopted, but they would have kept from office in Virginia nearly all those best qualified to fill it there was danger that conservative white men would vote against the Constitution and thereby prolong military rule in Virginia rather than submit to the enfranchisement of the Negroes and the disfranchisement of themselves. Fortunately, after the convention adjourned, this possibility was suggested, if Virginia would satisfy the first demand of the radicals by granting the franchise to Negroes, might not Congress be prevailed upon to sanction a separate vote of the people on the offensive sections disfranchising Confederates and prescribing a test oath? If that were done, native white men might cast their ballots for the rest of the new constitution and assure its adoption. This would fulfill the last harsh requirement of the short-sighted Reconstruction Act. Then Virginia might be readmitted to the Union without being delivered for a generation into the hands of the radicals and the enfranchised blacks. This proposal was duly formulated and was presented to General Grant, who regarded it favorably. Through the patient efforts of an able committee, a separate vote on the disfranchising sections of the new organic law was sanctioned by Congress and was authorized in an executive proclamation of May 14, 1869, which set July 6, 1869, as the date for the election of a governor and a legislature and for the rejection or ratification of the Constitution. Was it the policy of wisdom for conservative white men to vote for the Constitution, lest the objectionable clauses, and thereby accept the Negro as a voter, in order to get rid of military rule? Or was it better to stand out against the enfranchisement of the Negro, and to take the chances of the termination of military rule and the rest and of statehood at a later time, in some other way? The question was put to General Lee in the midst of the campaign and was answered directly, I have great reluctance to speak on political subjects, he said, because I am entirely withdrawn from their consideration and therefore mistrust my own judgment. I have, however, said in conversation with friends, that, if I was entitled to vote, I should vote for the excision of the obnoxious clauses of the proposed Constitution and for the election of the most conservative eligible candidates for Congress and the legislature. I believe this course offers the best prospect for the solution of the difficulties in which the state is involved, accessible to us. I think all who can should register and vote. This letter was not printed, but General Lee's opinion apparently became known and contributed to the desired result. The body of the Constitution was ratified, and the two objectionable sections were rejected by approximately 40,000 votes. 
a governor of moderate views and a conservative legislature were elected. On January 26, 1870, the president signed the bill readmitting Virginia to the Union. The next day, Military District No. 1 passed into the limbo of unhappy memories. About the time the political campaign of 1869 was at its hottest, soon after General Lee returned from Fredericksburg and on the eve of the college commencement, he completed a labor on which he had long been engaged, the editing of his father's memoirs of the war in the Southern Department. The first edition of this book, issued in 1812, had been in two well-printed volumes. In 1827, it will be remembered, a second edition, in one volume, badly printed on poor paper, had appeared. This contained some corrections and additions left in manuscript by Light Horse Harry and many good notes by Major Harry Lee. In 1866 interest in the sun created new interest in the sire. A third edition being demanded, Lee began to collect material for it and for a biographical sketch of his father with which he intended to preface the narrative. Charles Carter Lee, oldest living son of Light Horse Harry, sent copies of all the letters he had received from his father while he was at Harvard and Light Horse Harry was in the West Indies. William B. Reed of Pennsylvania, son of Governor Joseph Reed, gave Lee several letters written during the Revolution. At that time, Lee seems to have contemplated a general revision of the work and he discussed with Reed the details of a disputed chapter relating to the exploits of Sergeant Major John Champ, but he soon gave up all ambitious editorial designs. That same winter he borrowed part of Marshall's Washington and of Sparks' Correspondence of Washington from the library of the Franklin Literary Society and probably prepared the few unimportant references to these works that appear in the introductory sketch. He had to put his task aside temporarily and seemingly he did not take it up again until the autumn of 1867 when once more he was consulting Marshall. In the spring of 1869 he finished the new material for the book, though even then the concluding paragraphs show some signs of haste. The preface carries June 1, 1869, as the date of its completion. Later in the summer he was bothered by the publisher's insistence that a picture of Lee himself be inserted in the book. The general objected, but finally left the decision to Mrs. Lee, who sided with the publisher. Late in 1869 the book was published, and in 1870 it was reissued. Lee's receipts from it were given his brother Carter, who had supplied most of the letters. Aside from a table of contents and descriptive headings at the beginning of each chapter, the body of the new edition received very little attention at the hands of General Lee or of anyone else. Light Horse Harry Lee's numerous notes to the first edition had been retained in the second, and Major Henry Lee's notes had been signed ed. General Lee reprinted both sets and also those that had been contributed to the second edition by Colonel Howard, but he did not explain this anywhere in the book. Shunning the controversy raised by Judge Johnson's green and softening or omitting the asperities of some of the letters, he added only one note of consequence, that on Sergeant Major Champ. This was not signed and might readily have been credited to Light Horse Harry Lee but for the internal evidence. In one instance, a footnote from the second edition, citing an incident on another page, was republished without correcting the page number, which had been wrong when originally inserted. Instead of giving the proper page reference to the second edition, the note was based on the pagination of the first edition. The sketch of Light Horse Harry Lee that preceded the text is the longest single composition from the pen of his most distinguished son. Occupying 68 pages and containing nearly 34,000 words, from no point of view can it be accounted an effective piece of writing. The genealogy, which is adapted from that prepared by William Lee in 1771, is uncritical, confused, and laudatory and assumes the direct descent of the Virginia family from Lancelot Lee of London, who came to England with the Conqueror. It is very different in tone from anything General Lee ever wrote about himself. The career of Henry Lee from birth to his enlistment in the Revolutionary Army is covered in some 500 words. Circumstances attending his retirement from the army are scarcely touched upon. The whole of his public service, except as it related to military appointments, is handled summarily. Not even the dates of Lee's tenure of office as governor of Virginia are put down. More than a fourth of the sketch is given over to extracts from the letters to Charles Carter Lee that overflow with preachments and pious exhortation. The picture one gets at the end does less than justice to the man and to his record. 
Reading the sketch, one can understand why Gamaliel Bradford, in citing another paper by Lee, admitted that it went a long way toward reconciling him to the general's failure to write a history of his campaigns. The shortcomings of this solitary venture into biography are the more remarkable in view of General Lee's conversation about his father, conversation that was most entertaining and rich in diverting anecdote. Lee's letters, it probably will be agreed, were nearly always smooth and sometimes were written in a style that makes the reader's heart beat a trifle faster. But when he came to formal composition, most of the grace and all the spontaneity of his style disappeared. What he wrote became ponderous and dull. Only twice in the outline of his father's life did Lee show his own feelings. In relating how his father went to Stratford a wooing his cousin Matilda, he stopped to describe the place of his own birth, well remembered in all its details, though he had not seen it many years. The approach to the house is on the south, along the side of a lawn, several hundred acres in extent, adorned with cedars, oaks, and forest poplars. On ascending a hill not far from the gate, the traveller comes in full view of the mansion when the road turns to the right and leads straight to a grove of sugar maples around which it sweeps to the house. Stratford had about it then, at the end of his life, the glamour that had hung over it when he had been packed into the carriage with the rest of the family and had been sent away from that paradise to Alexandria. The other passage in which Lee the man showed himself through the work of Lee the author was in a quotation from a letter of Light Horse Harry Lee's. His friend James Madison had written in 1792 to know whether Lee would consider the command that subsequently was given St. Clair to subdue the Indians on the Miami and the Wabash. Light Horse Harry had expressed willingness to go but had acknowledged regret at the prospect of leaving my native country, as he styled Virginia. No consideration on earth, he wrote, could induce me to act a part, however gratifying to me, which could be construed into disregard or forgetfulness of this commonwealth. In republishing the letter General Lee italicized this sentence. Passing on to describe his father's efforts for a union of all the states, he concluded, although his correspondence at this time, as well as the course of his life, proves his devotion to the federal government, yet he recognized a distinction between his native country and that which he had labored to associate with it in the strictest bonds of union. Like sire, like son. Slow as was the preparation of this new edition of his father's memoirs, General Lee's accumulation of material for a history of his own campaigns lagged still more. In 1866, he was pleased at the prospect of getting copies of his correspondence with President Davis. They will be of great use to me, he said, and enable me to speak more fully of movements and their results. He was disappointed in this hope, however, and found much difficulty in locating other documents, especially those relating to the matter he most desired to establish accurately, namely, the comparative strength of the Union and Confederate armies. If the truth were told just now, he said to McRae in the spring of 1868, it would not be credited. He did not believe an impartial history could be written at so early a date, and he was discouraging to biographers. Sometimes when he was urged to undertake the book, he protested that he would be obliged to relate facts that would cause the conduct of others to be subjected to criticism and censure. Although he never wholly abandoned his project, he accumulated few reports and returns after 1866 and made no start at composition. His available letters contain nothing to confirm Jones's statement that Lee applied to the War Department for copies of his official papers and met with a denial. It is certain that Lee had not done this as late as July, 1868. Chapter 23, Lee's Theory of Education At the commencement of 1869, 38 students were awarded degrees, and some financial progress was recorded. General R. D. Lilly, the chief financial agent of the college, had worked with a zeal that won the fullest commendation of the trustees. Miss and Upshur Jones of New York had donated a valuable assortment of personal effects during the winter. Of his election to the Board of Trustees to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Colonel Samuel M. C. D. Reed, Cyrus H. McCormick had pledged an additional $5,000 to the endowment. To encourage small gifts, which had not always been paid when promised, the trustees sanctioned a plan whereby endowment certificates with coupons were issued, each good for a year's tuition. Vigor in furthering the campaign for funds was now urged once again by the trustees, without it, golden plans for making the college more useful to the country could not be started. These plans were set out for the approval of the trustees by the president and faculty in several papers that embody the fullest expression of General Lee's theory of education. 
The starting point was the deep conviction of General Lee that for all its poverty and distress, the South must promote general education. Nothing, he said in 1866, will compensate us for the depression of the standard of our moral and intellectual culture, and each state should take the most energetic measures to revive its schools and colleges, and, if possible, to increase the facilities of instruction and to elevate the standard of learning. To General John B. Gordon, he stated his premise more fundamentally, the thorough education of all classes of the people is most efficacious means, in my opinion, of promoting the prosperity of the South. Education, he believed, was the best endowment of youth, we must look to the rising generation for the restoration of the country. He did not accept the Negroes from the list of those whom education would help. While holding the deepest faith in education and in the college as a means of promoting it, General Lee did not regard academic training as a finishing process. It was only the beginning. He had written one of his sons years before, the education of a man or woman is never completed till they die. Frequently in his correspondence with the parents of his students he spoke of a college as laying the foundation of a solid education. Cultural studies he considered a most desirable element in this foundation, and he was always pleased when a student selected them. But from the beginning of his work at Lexington, where he found mathematics, Latin, and Greek well taught, he saw the South's need of better training in the sciences. With that in mind, he divided the School of Natural Philosophy, enlarged the instruction in chemistry, as already indicated, and built up a department of engineering. As time passed, he saw that the struggling South required men trained for the vocations as well as for the professions. His thought was given increasingly to what was styled practical education, in the phrase of the day. I agree with you fully, he wrote in 1867, as to the importance of a more practical course of instruction in our schools and colleges, which, while it may call forth the genius and energies of our people will tend to develop the resources and promote the interests of the country. At their meeting in June, 1868, the trustees had authorized the faculty to work out an extension of the scientific departments. The faculty, in turn, had named a committee to prepare a report under the direction of Lee. This was presented and considered at a special meeting of the board in March, 1869, and was then made public. At the annual meeting in June, 1869, the project was approved in most of its details and was given its final form. The great object of the whole plan, General Lee wrote in forwarding the report, is to provide the facilities required by the large class of our young men, who, looking to an early entrance into the practical pursuits of life, need a more direct training to this end than the usual literary courses. The proposed departments will also derive great advantage from the literary schools of the college, whose influence in the cultivation and enlargement of the mind is felt beyond their immediate limits. In other words, the planned proposed practical education in the cultural atmosphere of a university rather than in separate technical schools. Three new departments were projected, agriculture, commerce, and applied chemistry. The first named was to supply the student with virtually everything you would require for the scientific management of a farm, from plant physiology to cost accounting or rural economy. The School of Commerce was to combine the modern business college course with commercial geography, commercial law, and commercial economy, or the administration and financial management of commercial enterprises, banks, insurance and joint stock companies, railroads, canals, ships, steamers, telegraphs, etc. Applied chemistry was to cover mining in metallurgy and chemistry applied to the arts, industrial geology, botany, zoology and comparative anatomy, physiological chemistry, the use of the mouth blowpipe, glass blowing, the use of tools practically taught, photography, chemical technology, or the manufacture of acids, alkalis, salts, glass, pottery, illuminating gas and oils, soaps, paints, varnishes, discoveries, drugs, fermented and distilled liquors, vinegar, sugar, starch, bread, gelatin, leather, etc., and, finally, economy and the management of chemical manufacturers. In addition, the report recommended the development of the engineering schools to include training in mechanical engineering. With the proposed Department of Applied Chemistry, this would so broaden the instruction that three branches would be taught civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and applied chemistry. English and French were to be taught with all the engineering courses. 
In the mechanical studies, the report concluded, a large portion of time should be given to the neat and exact execution of working drawings of machines, masonry, carpentry, and c. Without skill in which essential labor no one is qualified to take charge of works of construction or superintend industrial establishments in such a manner as is called for by the present advanced state of the arts. Laboratory methods, though not given precisely that name, were emphasized. It is very important, read the report, that the instruction in these professional courses be made as practical as possible, and, to that end, that there be annexed to those departments a farm and garden, a mechanical workshop and a laboratory or workshop for metallurgical and chemical operations. All these might be remunerative, or at least should support themselves, the committee contended. Even the laboratory, if judiciously conducted, may be self-sustaining, instead of requiring heavy appropriations and fees to pay for costly experiments and destroyed apparatus, which has been the difficulty generally encountered in imparting instruction in practical chemistry to young and unskillful beginners, a difficulty which has often compelled this method of instruction, confessedly the best, to be reluctantly abandoned, even in institutions amply endowed. Along with the extension of the scientific departments, the faculty report of March 30, 1869, recommended the establishment of press scholarships, not exceeding 50, to young men intending to make practical printing and journalism their business in life, such scholarships to be free from tuition and college fees, on condition that when required by the faculty, they shall perform such disciplinary duties as may be assigned them in a printing office or in the line of their professions to a time equal to one hour in each working day. The faculty suggested, further, that the trustees either make some agreement with a printing office or else provide a plant at the college where students could receive instruction and, as far as practicable, be compensated for their labor. To establish desirable contacts and to simplify the entry of young printers and journalists into the college, the faculty suggested, moreover, that it be authorized to buy $5,000 of advertising and to pay for it in tuition and college fees. The trustees had promptly approved the general idea and the proposal to supply tuition in return for newspaper advertising, but they had called on the faculty to see what arrangements could be made outside the college for practical instruction in typographical art. Faculty members duly did this and reported in June that a limited number of boys could receive instruction in the plant of Lafferty and Company in Lexington without cost to the college. This expedient was approved in the hope that some larger or better plan would be developed from it. Pursuant to this authority, the college on August 9, 1869, circularized the typographical unions of the South, inviting them to nominate candidates, over 15 years of age, for scholarships that were to be good for a term of two years. Each holder of a scholarship was to labor one hour a day at his calling. This school, it must be remembered, was projected at a time when most of the country weeklies and many of the journals in small towns were owned and operated by practical printers, who usually conducted a job printing business as well. These papers generally afforded a living for only one man, and perforce were edited by their owners. Often the editorials were written at the case. That is, they were not penned and then put in type but were composed as the editor stood in front of his typecase with his stick and set them. Printers of this sort, their sons and helpers, were those for whom the press scholarships were intended. Apparently, the aim was to train the printer to be an editor rather than to qualify the prospective editor in the art of printing. The reason we propose giving these press scholarships is this, Professor William Preston Johnston told a reporter of the New York Sun. Printing is one of the arts which diffuse education and we should therefore seek to qualify printers for the task of educating as far as possible. We do not hope to make men fit for the editorial chair at once, but we do hope to give them as thorough a training as possible in the ways of their profession and to give them as good an education as possible that they may make better and more cultivated editors. Along with the extension of the scientific schools and the establishment of the press scholarships, the faculty recommended and the trustees approved the establishment of a separate chair of English language and literature as soon as funds were available. History and political economy were to be taken from that chair and, with international law, were to constitute a separate school. At the same time, the trustees authorized the selection of six resident masters who corresponded, in a sense, to the fellows of more recent appointment in American universities. Three men were to be named annually, for terms of two years, from among the graduating masters of arts of the college. 
they were to pursue at least one study in the college, were to teach one hour a day, were to have exemption from all college fees, and were each to receive $200 annually from the college. Efforts were to be made to endow these masterships at $3,000 each. Finally, in this enlarged program, a summer school was projected. It was to be under the care of an executive committee consisting of three members of the faculty and was to be taught by the assistant professors or by others specially licensed for the purpose. Students who passed the course of this summer school could be admitted to the regular college classes. Apparently, the purpose of this school was to supply the deficiencies in preparation that were then hampering the work of the college. These plans, like those General Lee had received when he came to Lexington, were pervaded with the ideals of Christianity. Taught in no school, religion was to be inculcated through all of them. Lee had come to Lexington as much a missionary as an educator. When he had told Pendleton in 1865 that he would not hesitate to give his services to the college if he thought he could be of any benefit to the youth of the South, he had used the word as much in its moral as in its educational sense. He meant precisely what he said in an oft-quoted remark, if I could only know that all the young men in the college were good Christians, I should have nothing more to desire. I dread the thought of any student going away from college without becoming a sincere Christian. His first conversation about the college, that with Rev. Mr. Wilmer, had turned to the part religion should have in his work there. The same purpose dominated to the last. Yet he rarely employed the term Christian education, he did not believe there was any other kind worthy of the name. If General Lee had lived longer and the funds had been found, still other educational ideals doubtless would have been developed at Washington College. As it was, the program of 1869 represents the scene at its widest before the curtain dropped. To summarize, General Lee took a college whose president and four professors, prior to his coming, had been teaching Greek, Latin, natural philosophy, mathematics, and moral philosophy to a handful of boys, and he either enlarged or planned to enlarge this institution to this general plan. 1. A classical college, with a Christian atmosphere, elective courses, and high standards, presenting the cultural studies as the foundation of a solid education. 2. A group of scientific schools, with special emphasis on chemistry and engineering, civil, mining, and mechanical, and with laboratory facilities for all the sciences. In these scientific schools, as in the classical courses, the elective system prevailed, but a fixed minimum of work was required. 3. In the classical college and for the schools of science, adequate training was to be provided in modern languages, including Spanish, which General Lee himself insisted was of special importance because the relations of the United States with Latin America were destined to be much closer. For a school of commerce, similar in many respects to those established in recent years in the United States. It did not cover economic theory, however, so fully as do modern courses in commerce, and it was intended to give students practical knowledge of subjects among which were some now relegated to business colleges, namely, office methods, including penmanship, bookkeeping, and stenography. 5. A school of agriculture, with what would now be styled a demonstration farm. 6. A system of press scholarships, designed primarily to acquaint young printers with editorial methods and to enlarge their education. 7. A school of law as an integral part of the college. 8. A summer school to assure the better preparation of students entering the regular courses. 9. The encouragement of advanced study through the establishment of resident masterships, corresponding to modern university fellowships. 10. The conduct of research, for the public welfare, by members of the faculty, or persons appointed for the purpose. In the particular circumstances of the college, the investigations undertaken were in topography. 11. Provision, by scholarship, for bringing selected young men to the college from the high schools and private academies of the South. 12. Frequent and rigid examination of all students in all departments. 13. In all the activities of the college, the honor system in its fullness to prevail. Poverty prevented the full attainment of this ideal in General Lee's time. Work in commerce did not develop beyond the modest proportions of a student's business school, which had been privately established some years before and subsequently was affiliated with the college. The Department of Agriculture was not opened, nor were the press scholarships used. Nevertheless, Lee's plan was definite and advanced. 
It attracted much attention at the time, particularly in the emphasis placed on practical education. The New York Herald predicted that the movement was likely to make as great an impression upon our old fogey schools and colleges as General Lee did in military tactics upon our old fogey commanders in the palmy days of the rebellion. The educational ideal of Washington College was not expressed solely in a formal curriculum and in the development of a more extended range of study. The college believed, also, in the physical training of youth. At a time when the trustees were searching for money with which to establish new departments, they considered the purchase of a playground and athletic field in modern collegiate phraseology. And when they scarcely were able to provide money for needed laboratory equipment, the trustees cheerfully appropriated $1,100 to equip a student's boat club. The literary societies were equally esteemed. There is scarcely a feature in the organization of the college, wrote General Lee, more improving or beneficial to the students than the exercises and influence of the societies. The alumni took their place, too, in the academic order that came into being during General Lee's administration. They had been organized for many years, but their society was vitalized and their part in the commencement exercises was magnified. In 1868-1869, a general catalogue of the alumni was prepared and was printed by order of the trustees. It contained a sketch of the history of the college, a list of all the known officials and teachers, and a roster of some hundreds of graduates and former students. Under many of the names were notes of service in the Confederate Army, and not a few were followed by the grim phrase, killed at Manassas or at Chancellorsville or died in service. Alumni were proud of their connection with the college and conscious of their responsibility toward it. The objects of this association, read the second article of the Constitution, are to keep fresh the pleasant memories of college life, to preserve and strengthen the ties of friendship there formed, and to exercise a filial care over the interests and welfare of alma mater, to whom we acknowledge a debt of gratitude never to be forgotten. Such was the college envisioned at legislation as Lee's five-year administration was drawing to its close. The question now to be answered is, how much of the ideal was directly contributed by General Lee? To what extent was he the author of the projects, many of them novel, presented for the approval of the trustees? The new professorships were established in 1865 with his consent and warm approval but probably not on his initiative. Plans for the extension of the scientific schools were prepared under his direction, and the section relating to instruction in agriculture probably originated with Professor Campbell and with him. Beyond this it is difficult to go. Nothing was put forward that was not approved by Lee or, at the least, acceptable to him, yet his authorship of specific proposals cannot be established. Many of the advances undoubtedly were suggested by his able colleagues. The press scholarships, for instance, were an advanced conception, yet it is far more likely that William Preston Johnston suggested them than that General Lee did. Johnston was interested in public affairs and was professor of English. He was a member of the committee that drew up the plan of the extension of the scientific courses. When a representative of the New York Sun journeyed to Lexington to know what the press scholarships were designed to do, Johnston and not Lee was the man who explained them to him. General Lee's connection with the plan probably was limited to endorsing it. From his own unpleasant experience with newspapers, he probably felt there was abundant need for the training Johnston advocated. The adoption of new methods and courses by members of the faculty was made easy by the nature of Lee's relations with the professors. He was president, none of his associates ever was in any sort of doubt about that, though he was often an elder brother to them and never an autocratic executive. He counseled them in their problems and visited them in their distress, but he required them to be at their posts and he insisted on prompt and accurate reports. In the only instance when he had to take disciplinary measures against a member of the faculty, an assistant professor, he promptly dismissed him and paid no heed to a student's petition for the reinstatement of the offender. The teachers had a certain awe of Lee. Humphreys found it easy to start a conversation with him, but sometimes embarrassing to continue it. On one of their long rides together, General Lee and Captain White were overtaken by darkness and had to spend the night at a farmhouse where there was only one vacant room and only one bed in that room. To White's dismay, he had to share the general's couch, but he spent the night on the rail and slept not at all, for fear of disturbing his chief. Privately, the professor admitted afterwards that he would as soon have thought of sleeping with the Archangel Gabriel as with General Lee. 
Outside the family, White was the general's closest friend in Lexington. That he was Lee's intimate, White insistently denied. No man, said he, was great enough to be intimate with General Lee. The other professors shared his feeling toward the general, and they would not have thought of crossing him or of presuming upon him. But in conferring with the instructors and in planning for the college, Lee encouraged free expression of opinion and the largest initiative. In matters of departmental control, he gave the teachers the maximum liberty of action. In his intercourse with his faculty, wrote Professor William Preston Johnston, he was courteous, kind, and often rather playful in manner. We all thought he deferred entirely too much to the expression of opinion on the part of the faculty when we would have preferred that he should simply indicate his own views or desire. In Professor Joynes's eyes, Lee seemed deliberately to minimize himself. If an associate had a new idea, he could present it without fear that it would be frowned upon or regarded as an act of insubordination. Lee never pretended to educational omniscience. In one of the most illuminating of all the observations on the relations of General Lee with his faculty, Dr. Gordon wrote, one proof of Lee's wisdom was his unwillingness to express his opinion on a subject which he had not carefully considered. On subjects which he had considered, he was the most dogmatic of men. But not infrequently at the meetings of the faculty he would say, gentlemen, this is a new question to me, I cannot venture an opinion. I prefer to hear what Dr. Kirkpatrick or Colonel Allen or Professor McCullough has to say about it. In every case he would name the man who ought to have been, and who generally was, most familiar with, and best informed on, the subject under discussion. Lee never made a speech before the professors, though he quieted many a brewing storm. Faculty meetings, one imagines, had much the atmosphere of General Lee's headquarters mess during the quiet periods of the war between the states. But when his professors faced problems of instruction or of organization, he treated them much as he did his corps commanders in action, he gave them the warmest moral support and he brought to the scene all his resources for their use, but he let them make their own dispositions. Under this system, the best qualities of his faculty were aroused. Their ambition was to please him. They considered it an honor to work in a college he directed, and they felt that they were making educational history. Complete harmony and the utmost energy, in Joynes's phrase, pervaded the college. The faculty did not labor in vain or follow to no purpose the leadership of the president. Washington College became a mighty force in Southern education and, through its engineering school, was largely the inspiration of the men who developed the steel industry in the South. Defeated in war, Lee triumphed in his labor to upbuild the South. Chapter 24 The Beginning of the End The general decline in Lee's health had become so serious by June 1869 that he seems even to have thought that the strain of commencement might prove fatal to him. After that ordeal was behind him, he had to consider his physical condition in making his plans for the summer. He hoped that he might visit Rooney and Robert after the college closed and still be able to return to Lexington in time for the annual meeting on July 13 of the Educational Association of Virginia. Although he was a member of that body, he had never attended any of its conventions, and he felt that if he absented himself when the organization met at his own town, he would be considered inimical to it. By shortening his stay with his sons he might have gone down to the Pamunkey and have been back by the date of the meeting, but for the fact that new college officers were to begin their duties on July 1st and would require some coaching. He accordingly gave up his plan and stayed in Lexington, which he found so quiet and pleasant, with the students away, that he wished he could remain there all summer. The Educational Association duly convened at the college with some of the most eminent teachers of the state in attendance, John B. Minor, Basil L. Gildersleeve, Matthew Fontaine Maury, Charles L. Koch, and John P. McGuire among them. General Lee doubtless was present, but he made no address and served on none of the committees. Very soon after the convention ended, the general took Mrs. Lee to the Rockbridge Baths, where she had decided she would spend the summer. Scarcely had Lee reached the springs, however, when he received the unexpected news that his brother Sidney Smith Lee had died at Richland, his home on the Potomac. The general set out immediately, but had to contend, as usual, with very poor transportation. When he arrived at Alexandria, on the evening of July 24, it was to find that the funeral had occurred late the previous afternoon. Lee was much shaken by the sudden taking of a brother he had loved to the end of his life as warmly as in the days of their boyhood in that same old city. 
he wrote Mrs. Lee, may God bless us all and preserve us for the time when we, too, must part, the one from the other, which is now close at hand, and may we all meet again at the footstool of a merciful God, to be joined by his eternal love never more to separate. In melancholy mood, he went from the mansion house, Alexandria, to Ravensworth, rested a day or two in its pleasant shade, and wandered about the well-beloved old house. At the door of the room in which his mother had died, he paused, almost overwhelmed by memories. Forty years ago, he said, I stood in this room by my mother's deathbed. It seems now, but yesterday. Robert was with him, having come up to attend the funeral, and he now prevailed on the general to return home by way of the White House. Lee reached there on July 30th, and on August 1st he attended St. Peter's Church in New Kent County, a place precious to the family because of the tradition that George Washington had married within its walls the widow Custis from whom Mrs. Lee was descended. The general did not think his daughter-in-law was looking well, and he believed that her baby, his namesake, would be the better for a trip to the mountains. So he prevailed on young Mrs. Lee to go to the springs with him. He was pleased at the prospect of having the young mother and her child in his care, and he hastened to write his excuses to a friend at whom home he had promised to stop on his way but also. I shall travel up, he wrote, in a capacity that I have not undertaken for many years, as escort to a young mother and her infant, and it will require the concentration of all my faculties to perform my duties even with tolerable comfort to my charge. On August 2 the mother went to Petersburg to see her family for a day, while the general and Rooney awaited her in Richmond. As always happened now, whenever he was away from Lexington, visitors began to pour in on Lee in such numbers that he was compelled to hold an impromptu reception in the parlors of his stopping place, the Exchange Hotel. The next day, August 3, he set out for the Springs, and after a long railroad trip and a wearying drive from Goshen to Rockbridge Baths, safely delivered the mother and the youngster to Mrs. Lee. It was a tedious journey, and it may not have been altogether prudent, for the youthful object of the general's care was just recovering from a severe attack of whooping cough. Obedient to his doctor's order, the general departed in a few days for the white sulphur, in the hope that its waters would benefit his health. He took with him Mildred and Agnes, who found a gay season in progress. George Peabody was among the guests, as was the general's tablemate of the summer of 1867, W. W. Corcoran of Washington. It probably was while Lee was at this resort that Rev. W. F. Broadus began to talk of a meeting there in behalf of his project to establish an orphanage of the children of Virginia soldiers killed during the war. Jones stated that General Lee frequently wrote Mr. Broadus about this and conferred in person with him regarding it. Lee's sympathies were of course with the enterprise, and his contributions to it were frequent. But when it was planned to hold a gathering at the Springs, where inflammatory eloquence probably would have been applied for the extraction of gifts, he declined to attend. General Lee desired, in fact, to avoid all public gatherings that had anything to do with the war. On two or three occasions he wrote as though he would have gone, if he could, to meetings held to memorialize the dead or to dedicate Confederate burial grounds, but in actual fact after the war he never was present at a single assembly of any sort related in any way to the struggle between the states. I think it wisest, he wrote, not to keep open the sores of war, but to follow the example of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife and to commit to oblivion the feelings it engendered. He even held, in 1866, that it was unwise at that time to attempt to raise Confederate monuments. He wrote General Rosser, all, I think, that can now be done is to aid our noble and generous women in their efforts to protect the graves and mark the last resting places of those who have fallen and wait for better times. Every such effort to care for the tombs of Southern soldiers had his instant endorsement. The graves of the Confederate dead will always be green in my memory, and their deeds be hallowed in my recollection, thus he wrote the chairman of a memorial association in Richmond. When the proposal was first made in 1866 to bring back to their native states the bones of the Confederate slain at Gettysburg, he expressed the belief that the Gettysburg Association would not be lacking in respect for the Southern men buried there. In any case, he said, it would be time enough to talk of moving them when a reason for it arose, I am not in favor of disturbing the ashes of the dead, unless for a worthy object, and I know of no fitter resting place for a soldier than on the field on which he has nobly laid down his life. 
hearing, for years later, that what had been feared by many had come to pass and that the graves of the Confederates were being neglected at Gettysburg, General Lee was for restoring to Virginia soil the ashes of the men who at his command had charged the ridge. He set aside in this instance his rule against the publication of his letters of endorsement, and both he and his family contributed generously to the fund being raised for the reinterment. But his opposition to fervid meetings remained unchanged. They aroused old passions and they might stir up ill will against the South. It was in the spirit, no doubt, that he discouraged Mr. Broadus's plan, and it was in the same spirit that he declined to read books on the war. They kept alive feelings it was better to bury for the country's good. Late in arriving, he had but a short stay at the Springs, and before the end of August he was back in Lexington, preparing for the family's return. He did not leave again until spring, though he received many invitations to visit different parts of the South. One of the most pressing was to attend a commercial convention in Louisville on October 12. He sent in reply an optimistic letter in which he affirmed that if the people cherished the principles of their fathers and practiced their virtues, they would find it easy to revive the South. Every man must, however, do his part in this great work. He must carry into the administration of his affairs industry, fidelity, and economy, and apply the knowledge taught by science to the promotion of agriculture, manufactures, and all industrial pursuits. In my particular sphere, I have to attend to my proper business, which occupies so much of my attention that I have but little time to devote to other things. His proper business was heavy enough after September 16, when the college opened. The attendance was slightly less than that of the previous season, but the geographical distribution of the student body was wider. As other colleges in Virginia were now somewhat restored, the students from the Old Dominion, who had numbered 130 in 18678 and 111 in 18681869, dropped to 77. The boys from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas also formed a somewhat smaller contingent, but there were larger groups from most of the other parts of the South. All the states of the Confederacy were represented by at least 10 men each. 20 came from the North. All these young men had to be assigned to their classes and adjusted to the life of the college, a troublesome task, though one soon discharged. The session got smoothly underway and passed with few incidents. Its chief feature was the vigorous continuance of the campaign for endowment. George Peabody had assigned the college a claim he had against the Commonwealth of Virginia and was indirectly in correspondence with the college regarding it at the time of his death. Expectations were raised also by reports that Missourians had given $10,000 to support the chair of applied chemistry and that General W. S. Harney of the United States Army had donated $1,000 toward the endowment of the presidential chair in the college. General Lee was much gratified by the benevolence of Harney and wrote his personally, recalling kindnesses done him by that federal officer in the years preceding the war. Along with these satisfactions came distress in November at the fate of Professor Frank Preston. He had been graduated a Bachelor of Arts in 1860, had been a volunteer in the Rockbridge Artillery, and had been captain in the Cadet Corps at the Virginia Military Institute. Chosen assistant professor of Greek in Washington College, he resigned in 1869 to accept the professorship of Greek and German in the College of William and Mary. Scarcely had he entered upon his duties when he sickened and died. Lee was much attached to the young artillery Hellenist. He issued a sorrowful announcement to the student body and suspended classes for the day, a rare occurrence at Washington College. The life of the family was very pleasant that fall. Mrs. Rooney Lee and the general's little grandson, Robert, remained in Lexington for some time after they left the Springs. Edward Child paid another visit at the end of September and brought with him not only a wife, but also the little dog of woeful countenance that aroused the general's pity. Mrs. Lee's health was no better, but she was able to ride out with the general, on sunny autumn afternoons, in the carriage he had purchased for her the previous spring in Baltimore. These were their last rides together. She was not with him, however, the afternoon he had trouble with the strong-limbed Lucy Long. He used her to pull the carriage, Traveller disdained such employment, and that day he had driven down the river, with Mrs. Rooney Lee and the baby, to call on the William Preston Johnstons. They made the trip comfortably, and the general was driving the mare up the stiff grade to the front of the house when she stumbled and fell as if dead. 
Lee jumped out, began to unfasten her harness and soon discovered that she had been choked by a tight collar. The general was acutely distressed and reproached himself hotly for having permitted such a thing to happen. He caressed the animal and told her that he was ashamed of himself for mistreating her in this wise after all her fidelity to him. It is quite within the possibilities that the excitement of this incident contributed to the illness that marked the beginning of the end. The symptoms commenced about October 22, 1869, and at first were simply those of another severe cold, which kept Lee indoors and forced him to be absent from the faculty meeting of October 26. He was better within a week and on November 2 was able to take a ride on Traveller and to confer with the faculty, but he was again confined to the house for a few days, and when he was allowed to go out once more, his weakness was pronounced and he felt a certain depression of spirits. Traveler's trot is harder to me than it used to be and fatigues me very much, he had to admit to his son at the beginning of December. Truth was, his doctors by this time had diagnosed his malady as the same inflammation of the heart sac from which in 1863 he had suffered much. This was attended now by rheumatism of the back, right side, and arms. Rapid exercise, afoot or on horseback, caused difficulty in breathing. Apparently the physicians did not explain to him the nature of his trouble, but he knew his heart was affected. He confided this to Custis, and told his eldest son that he considered himself doomed, but he said nothing of it to any other member of the family. As Christmas approached, he wrote cheerfully to Rooney, who could not come to Lexington for the holidays, and he sent a message to Robert in the same spirit. On New Year's Day he kept open house to his friends and had much satisfaction in serving them oysters procured in Norfolk through Colonel Walter Taylor. He still had strength for his correspondence and he did not miss another faculty meeting until the end of March, 1870. He was able, too, to see visitors, bidden and unbidden. One afternoon, during the autumn, a stranger accosted him at the gate of his house, talked with him for a few moments, when Rev. J. William Jones, pastor of the Baptist Church and a chaplain of the college, walked up for a chat. After they had exchanged greetings, Lee remarked of the man who had just left, that is one of our soldiers who is in necessitous circumstances. Jones, who was already something of an historian and was wholly unreconstructed, inquired to what command the veteran belonged. He fought on the other side, said Lee, very simply, but we must not remember that against him now. Jones subsequently learned from the man that General Lee had given him money to help him on his way. As the winter wore along, the general's free movement was greatly hampered by his physical condition. He rode out when the weather was favorable and he could do so with somewhat less discomfort once he mounted his horse, but he could not walk much further than to his office. Constantly in pain, he was unable to attend to anything beyond his college duties and his necessary correspondence. He insisted he was better, as February passed, but by the middle of March he was less optimistic and had reached the conclusion that if the spring brought no improvement, he would resign. I am admonished by my feelings, he said, that my years of labor are nearly over and my inclinations point to private life. He did not come readily to this belief that he would soon have to leave the college. As recently as the previous December, in declining the presidency of the Southern Life Insurance Company, he had written that he felt he should not abandon the position he held, so long as he could be of service to the college. The professors of the college, seeing him almost daily, realized how serious his condition had become. Individually, from time to time, they urged him to take a long rest. He met every such appeal with a courteous, no. Feeling that it was his sense of discovery and his unwillingness to burden them that kept him from going away, they arranged among themselves a division of his college work and wrote him a letter in which they asked him to take a vacation and to spend it in travel for his health. In order that he might not be embarrassed by any nomination of their own, they proposed that he select one of their number to be titular acting president in his absence. It is quite likely that the suggestion of travel was made after conference with his physicians, who were very anxious for him to seek a climate where he would be less liable to contract colds. Upon the delivery of this communication from the faculty, Lee's doctor and his family united with the professors in new importunities. Lee yielded. I think I should do better here, he wrote, and am very reluctant to leave my home in my present condition, but they seem so interested in my recovery and so persuasive in their uneasiness that I should appear obstinate, if not perverse, if I resisted longer. 
On March 22, 1870, he formally notified the faculty that he had decided to take their suggestion and that he would name Professor Kirkpatrick to act as president in his absence. The selection evidently was made with care, for Dr. Kirkpatrick, professor of moral philosophy, was a mature man of wide educational experience. Lee very promptly decided where he would go. He had long desired to visit the grave of his daughter, Annie, near the White Sulphur Springs, Warren County, North Carolina, for he had been unable to make the trip when, in August, 1866, the friendly people of the neighborhood had unveiled a simple monument to her memory. I have always promised myself to go, there, he told Rooney, and I think, if I am to accomplish it, I have no time to lose. I wish to witness her quiet sleep, with her dear hands crossed over her breast, as if it were in mute prayer, undisturbed by her distance from us, and to feel that her pure spirit is waiting in bliss in the land of the blessed. From Warrington, he purposed to go either to Norfolk or to Savannah, and on his return journey he intended to stop and see his sons. His daughter Agnes, who had nursed him during his sickness, was to accompany him now. Chapter 25 The Final Review on the afternoon of Thursday, March 24, looking very badly, General Lee left Lexington on the canal packet boat for Lynchburg to begin a tour for his health, as his father had done at the end of his career. If it had been a quiet journey on which he set out, it might have benefited him greatly and might perhaps have prolonged his life. As it was, his two months of travel probably hastened his death. Much of his time had to be spent on the railroads, and many of his days were crowded with all the incidents of a triumphant progress, full of excitement and most injurious to an impaired heart. Still, if his sands were running out so swiftly that a few months were of no great moment, there could not have been a more fitting close. Was he preparing to face his Maker? Did he ask himself if he had walked humbly in the ways of God's appointing? Had he chosen rightly and counseled with prudence after the war? If, on his knees in prayer, he put these heart-searching questions, the South was ready to answer them for him. The last and most beautiful chapter of his life was opening. In its initial stage, his travel was retired. After a wearying night on the canal and a tedious day on the railroad, he reached Richmond on the afternoon of Friday, March 25th, and went to the Exchange and Ballard House. Too weak to go visiting or even to attend to some purchases Mrs. Lee had asked him to make, he remained quietly at the hotel and saw only the personal friends who called. The Senate of Virginia, however, as soon as it learned he was in Richmond, unanimously extended him the privileges of the floor and would have been pleased to accord him a formal reception, an honor he declined in a characteristic letter. On Saturday, he had a two-hour examination by three of the leading physicians of the city, who told him they would study his case further and would report their findings to his doctor in Lexington. I think I feel better than when I left Lexington, certainly stronger, but am a little feverish. Whether it is produced by the journey, or the toddies that Agnes administers, I do not know, thus he reported himself to Mrs. Lee. The hotel at which he stopped in Richmond consisted of two buildings on opposite sides of Franklin Street, connected by an overhead bridge. The general was crossing this bridge with Agnes one day during his visit when he encountered the familiar figure of Colonel John S. Mosby, he of the renowned partisan rangers. The general was pale and haggard, Mosby subsequently wrote, and did not look like the Apollo I had known in the army. They exchanged greetings, and a little later Colonel Mosby called at the general's room for a social chat. I felt oppressed by the great memories that his presence revived, Mosby wrote, and while both of us were thinking about the war, neither of us referred to it. Mosby left ere long, but soon was back again, bringing with him a man whose presence recalled the tragedy of Gettysburg and the dread day of Five Forks, General George E. Pickett. Mosby had met Pickett, by chance, just after he had left the room, and when he had remarked that he had called on their old commander, Pickett had said that he would pay his respects if Mosby would return with him, but that he did not want to be alone with Lee. The general had not seen Pickett since Appomattox, if, indeed, he saw him then, and he had conducted no correspondence with him after the war. From Mosby's account it would seem that General Lee received Pickett with his full reserve, a reserve that could be icy and killing though coupled always with perfect courtesy. Sensing the unpleasantness of the meeting, Mosby got up in a few moments and Pickett followed him. Once outside the room, Pickett broke out bitterly against that old man who, he said, had my division massacred at Gettysburg. 
As far as is known, General Lee never afterwards referred to the meeting or to General Pickett, but this was not an experience to be coveted for a man with heart disease. A much more welcome visitor was Colonel J. L. Corley, who had been Lee's chief quartermaster, an able and devoted man. Without hinting that he thought General Lee needed an escort, Colonel Corley decided he should accompany his old chieftain on his projected journey, and by one device or another, diplomatically prevailed upon the general to let him make the arrangements to attend him southward from Charlotte, where he offered to meet him on an agreed date. It was a service of the most considerate sort, unobtrusively rendered from love of his old leader, and it contributed immeasurably to lessen the discomfort of the trip. On the afternoon of Monday, March 28, at 2 o'clock, the general and his daughter left Richmond for Warrington, N.C. They reached their objective at 10 o'clock the same night and received warm welcome at Ingleside, the home of Mr. and Mrs. John White, who were known to Agnes, as were many others in the neighborhood, from her stay among them in the second year of the war. The next morning, March 29, the Whites supplied the general and his daughter with masses of white hyacinths, and Captain William J. White, John White's son, placed a team and vehicle at their disposal that they might go unaccompanied to the cemetery. My visit was mournful, yet soothing to my feelings, the general wrote Mrs. Lee. From the graveyard they drove to the home of Joseph Jones, where they were entertained at dinner, and then they returned to Captain White's house. A number of people called during the evening. I was glad, Lee told his wife, to have the opportunity of thanking the kind friends for their care of Annie while living in their attention to her since her death. I saw most of the ladies of the committee who undertook the preparation of the monument and the enclosure of the cemetery. Perhaps this kindness disposed him to yield to the importunities of Mr. White's daughters and to give them a lock of his hair, which is to this day one of the treasures of the family. Now began the public part of the tour, public not because Lee desired it so, but because the people heard of his coming and insisted on honoring him. The general left Warrington that night, March 29, with Agnes, aboard a sleeping car, the first on which he had ever ridden, but he was rendered wakeful by the novelty and the interruptions. At Raleigh, which was some sixty miles distant, via the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad, scores were waiting in the station. Lee, Lee, they cried, and cheered him again and again. But had retired and no doubt was glad to escape an appearance. At another station on the way the same sounds of affectionate welcome reached Lee's ears. The journey continued all the next day, by way of Salisbury, Charlotte, and Columbia. As the presence of the general on the train soon was known, word was dispatched ahead by the railroad telegraphers. Former Confederates sent in fruit from the other cars. At every place where the train stopped for meals the proprietors of the restaurant served lunches and coffee on his car as soon as they learned the general would not alight. Salisbury had a band and a multitude to do him honor. So had Charlotte, where the faithful Corley reported himself. Namesakes appeared on the way, of all sizes. Old ladies stretched their heads into the windows at way stations and then drew back and said, he is mighty like his pictures, so Agnes wrote her mother. Columbia, S.C., was reached in a pouring rain, but presented a great crowd. Most of the stores had been closed. All the Confederate veterans had been mustered and, with a large number of other citizens, had been marched in procession to the station of the Charlotte, Columbia and Augusta Railroad. Colonel Alexander Haskell was master of ceremonies, he who had commanded the 7th North Carolina Cavalry and in October, 1864, had been wounded in battle with Butler. In the crowd, also, was General W. Porter Alexander, Longstreet's chief of artillery and the man who had conducted the bombardment that had preceded Pickett's charge. But there were no war reminiscences now, only smiles and handshakes and cheers. General Lee was forced to go to the platform, where he was introduced by Colonel Haskell and was met with a roar. He bowed his acknowledgments but made no speech. Finally. At 9.30 on the evening of March 30th, nearly 24 hours after the general had left Warrington, he reached Augusta, Georgia, where he expected to spend the night, before going on to Savannah. Mayor Allen and a committee of citizens were at the station to receive him. The guest was placed in a carriage with the mayor, Miss Russell, and Alderman Stovall. Agnes and Colonel Corley rode in a second carriage with General McClaws, Colonel Raines, and Major T. P. Branch. The party was escorted to the Planters Hotel, where others gathered to pay their respects. 
Li was weary, for the journey had been exhausting, and he yielded to the appeal that he remain in Augusta a day and not attempt to go on to Savannah the next morning. But if it was rest he sought, he did not find it. He had to hold a reception nearly the whole of the forenoon. Crowds came, Agnes wrote her mother. Wounded soldiers, servants, and workingmen even. The sweetest little children, namesakes, dressed to their eyes, with bouquets of japonica, or tiny cards in their little fat hands, with their names. Among the callers were friends of other days, and several of Lee's old generals, among them A. R. Wright and W. M. Gardner, as well as McClaws. The people must have thronged Lee, for it is recorded that a boy of thirteen, who wished to see him, had to worm his way through the crowd until, at length, he stood by the side of the general and looked up at him in wondering reverence. This lad's name was Woodrow Wilson. That evening there was a serenade and another crowd. It was far too fast a pace for a man in Lee's condition. But what was he to do? How was he to deny himself to the women who had prayed for him, to the men who had fought with him, or to the parents of those who had fallen in his ranks? The next day, April 1st, the general and his daughter left the hotel with Colonel Corley for Savannah. A swift team carried him in a carriage to the station, his veterans mustered once again and gave him a rebel yell. He bowed and retired into the private car that had been attached to the train. But he was not quite through with generous Augusta. A boy of fourteen, who had climbed aboard, opened the door, rushed impulsively in and offered him a white rose he had plucked that morning and had brought into town with him. General Lee, wrote the boy when he was past seventy, laid aside his paper, rose from his seat, bowed with the grace of a Chesterfield, took the rose and said, I thank you, my son, and now with your permission I will present it to my daughter. Miss Lee herself gave a gracious smile. I see by the books under you of arm that you are a schoolboy. Study hard and make a man of yourself. At some point on the journey of 160 miles to the familiar city of Lee's first engineering labors, a reception committee came aboard. It included former Quartermaster General Lawton, General J. F. Gilmer, who had been Chief Engineer of the War Department, Andrew Lowe, and others. In their company, a little after six, the general left the train at Savannah to face one of the largest crowds that ever assembled to welcome him. The people had been disappointed by his non-arrival the previous day and now they overflowed the train shed. His escort had difficulty in making a way for him to the open barouche that was in waiting for him. Cheer followed cheer until the general had to rise and bow his acknowledgments. The Negroes of the city and some of the federal garrison joined cheerfully in the demonstration. As soon as the cheering crowd would permit, Lee was driven to the home of General Lawton at the corner of York and Lincoln Streets. Later in the evening, he was taken to the residence of Andrew Lowe, where he was to sleep. With the exception of an appearance of weariness, General Lee looks better than we expected to find him, the Savannah Republican reported, yet, it appeared to us that an inexpressible sadness was visible in his features, momentarily, no doubt, and caused by the demonstrations of filial love and devotion thus shown him by a people whom he had striven in vain to liberate from political bondage. After the general had left, the Washington Comet Band and the Sax Horn Band appeared in front of the Lawton House to serenade him. A crowd gathered quickly, and the bands alternated with selections. When Dixie was played, it seemed from the shouts as if the days of the Confederacy had come back again. In answer to the calls for the city's guest, General Lawton came out and thanked the people but asked them to excuse the old commander on account of weariness. He tactfully refrained from saying that General Lee was at Mr. Lowe's, as that, of course, would have started the crowd thither. The bands then struck up the bonny blue flag and presently marched off to serenade General Joseph E. Johnston, who was then residing in Savannah. A drive about the town the next morning, April 2, was followed by calls on the families he knew. After that came a dinner at Mr. Lowe's with a number of his comrades, among them General Joseph E. Johnston, General Lawton, and General Gilmer. It was the first time Lee had seen Johnston since the war. In his correspondence, there is no reference to this fact or to the character of their conversation, but it doubtless was cordial. During this visit to Savannah, the two were photographed to in the familiar picture that shows them, grizzled and old and feeble, seated on opposite sides of a small table. The Confederate officers Lee saw in Savannah were more numerous and better circumstanced than any he had met. 
he felt justified in presenting to them the plight and the needs of one of the most loyal and distressed of their comrades, General Samuel Cooper. Having learned on his last visit to Alexandria that Cooper was overtaxing his strength at hard, uncongenial work in an effort to earn a living for his family, Lee proposed that his old associates raise a fund for General Cooper's relief. General Lawton and others quickly agreed. They collected some $300 after General Lee's departure. He added $100 on his own account and sent the whole to Cooper on August 4. You must pardon me for moving in this matter, Lee then wrote his longtime companion in arms. Lee was happy to greet old friends and to make new. Particularly was he pleased when the McKays got back to town and reopened their familiar house in Broughton Street. But he found the pace too hard and in his letters home expressed regret that he had undertaken the long journey. I wish I were back, he said, though he much appreciated the hospitality shown him. Declining an invitation from General Chilton to visit Columbus, Georgia, he planned to go down into Florida on April 8 and on the way to visit Cumberland Island, where his father was buried, but Agnes fell sick and that prevented his departure until Tuesday, April 12. He set out town aboard the steamer Nick King, which ran leisurely between Savannah and Palatka on the St. John's River. With him and his daughter went his Savannah host, Andrew Lowe, thinking Agnes and I were unable to take care of ourselves, as the general confided to Mrs. Lee. At Brunswick, where the people turned out to see him, the party was joined by William Nightingale, grandson of General Nathaniel Green and successor to the ownership of Dungeness, the estate on which Light Horse Harry Lee had died. When the boat tied up at Cumberland Island they went ashore to the burial ground. Agnes decorated my father's grave with beautiful fresh flowers, Lee wrote, and added simply, I presume it is the last time I shall be able to pay to it my tribute of respect. The cemetery is unharmed and the grave is in good order, though the house of Dungeness has been burned and the island devastated. Entering historic St. John's River, Lee and his daughter about four o'clock on the afternoon of Wednesday, April 13, touched at Jacksonville, Florida. As soon as the gangplank was lowered, a committee from the city came aboard to greet the general in the upper saloon of the vessel. People streamed aboard until the Nick King was almost swamped. One by one, duly introduced, they passed and joyfully shook hands with Lee. As many more remained disappointed on shore, unable to get on the ship. To satisfy them, the general was asked to go on deck. When he walked out and stood where he could be seen, a strange thing happened, a complete silence fell on the throng, a silence of admiring reverence, as if the people thought it would be worse than discourtesy to applaud the old chieftain who embodied in their eyes the cause for which they had fought. The very silence of the multitude, reported the Jacksonville Union, spoke a deeper feeling than the loudest huzzas could have expressed. Jacksonville people were anxious for the general to stop there, but he had made his plans to go on to Palatka aboard the same vessel, and, as usual, he held to his schedule. So, after half an hour, the crowd left with tears and a God bless you and the Nick King continued southward up the broad river, past a landscape that delighted the general. The boat was to remain for the night of April 13 at Palatka, before beginning its return trip, and there it was met by another old friend, whom Lee probably had not seen since he had sorrowfully said goodbye at Appomattox, Colonel R. G. Cole, Chief Commissary of the Army of Northern Virginia. He lived on a plantation near Palatka, and, of course, insisted on entertaining his old chief. As it was a pleasant, warm day, Lee could walk out of doors among Colonel Cole's orange trees and pluck fruit from them. He enjoyed, also, the abundant, inviting fish. The return voyage was quieter. About 4 p.m., April 14, the boat tied up at Jacksonville. As it was not to sail until 3 o'clock the next morning, the general and his party were escorted ashore, were driven about the town, and were entertained by Colonel Sanderson. From Jacksonville, they went on to Savannah, where they arrived during the forenoon of Saturday, April 16. Lee then determined not to return home by the most direct route, but to come up the coast so as to visit Charleston, S.C., and friends in Tidewater, Virginia. On the morning of April 25, he left Savannah for Charleston, accompanied now only by Agnes, whose health was giving her father some concern. The political situation in South Carolina was tense at this time, and General Lee was anxious to escape all demonstrations that might heat blood and provoke a clash. 
Accordingly, he hoped that word of his coming might not precede him, but a telegram was sent by some admirer a short time before the train was due to reach the Carolina city, and a company of his friends met him at the station. They respected his wishes, however, and permitted him to be driven quietly to the home of W. Jefferson Bennett, who was to be his host. Major H. E. Yun, the Charleston member of his staff, had planned to entertain him, but had bereavement in his family. Mr. Bennett was a citizen of wealth and standing, with two sons at Washington College. He had six attractive young people in his household, at 60 Montague Street, when General Lee arrived. All of them welcomed their guest with much awe and trembling, but were soon put at ease by his manner toward them. Within a few hours the whole city began to clamor for a glimpse of him. That evening the post band serenaded. The next morning his old friends began to call. A delegation came to ask if he would not agree to hold a reception at one of the hotels to give the public an opportunity of greeting him. He excused himself, but he could not escape the admiring homage of the people. Mr. Bennett thereupon announced a reception to the Confederate officers of Charleston in honor of General Lee and designated A. B. Murray to receive the guests at the door and to present them. Among others came Major Houston Lee, who during General Lee's service in the Carolinas early in 1862 had been quartermaster in the Charleston district. As soon as the major entered the room, Lee said, I have a crow to pick with you, major. The former quartermaster at once inquired why. Lee challenged him, had not the major been in Richmond on such and such a date, and had he not gone to witness a review beyond the city? Lee thought he had seen him at that time. The major answered in astonishment that he had been there. Then, why, concluded Lee, did you not come up and speak to me? Major Lee excused himself by saying he had not presumed to approach the commanding general, but he left the reception in amazement. He had met the general only two or perhaps three times, yet Lee had noticed him among the thousands at the review in the summer of 1862, and now, eight years after, instantly recalled both the man and the incident. The fire units of the town had a parade on the afternoon of April 27, and when they were dismissed the white companies assembled in Meeting Street, procured a band, and marched to the Bennett House. Their cheers brought the general to the portico, where he bowed his acknowledgments. This would not suffice. Introductions were demanded and much brief speech-making was staged. At General Lee's request, C. G. Memminger, former Confederate Secretary of the Treasury, expressed the General's appreciation of the compliment paid him. Still the firemen held on. Just one word, they kept crying until, at last, the General thanked them in a few sentences and pleaded his indisposition as the reason for his silence. It was the nearest he was brought to the embarrassment of a public address during the whole of his tour. Mr. Bennett had planned a general reception for the evening of the 29th, but had realized that many women and children would not venture on the streets at night, and consequently he invited some to call between 1 and 3 p.m., while those who had escorts were bidden for the evening. Between the two affairs a very notable dinner was served. The guests were as much surprised at the general's memory for names as Major Lee had been. He chatted for a few moments with all who were presented to him, and then, when they came to go, he shook hands with each again and called every one of them by name. To a little girl who had given him a flower, he said as she was leaving with her mother, See, Rosa, I have not lost your flower. It was, altogether, a great event, which the Charleston Courier grew eloquent in describing, old and young, the gray beards and sages of the country, the noble, pure, honorable, poor and wealthy, with hardly an exception, were present and glad to do him honor. Stately dames of the old school, grandmothers of seventy, and a long train of granddaughters, all flocked around the noble old chief, glad of a smile, of a shake of the hand, and happy was the girl of twelve, or fourteen, who carried away on her lips the parting kiss of the grand old soldier. General Lee seemed feeble and weary that evening, but he was pleased to observe the good cheer of the people. It is so grateful, he said, to see so much elasticity among your people, and I am astonished to see Charleston so wondrously recuperated after all her disasters. So far as the records show, General Lee did not revisit in Charleston any of the scenes of his labors in the first winter of the war. He kept away purposely from the places that revived the memories of the war, not only in the South Carolina port, but wherever he traveled. 
After 1865, he went to five cities only that were connected with his own military operations, Richmond, Petersburg, Fredericksburg, Charleston, and Savannah. Aboard train or on steamer he passed by the Richmond-Petersburg defenses, and several times he used the railroad that crossed the old battleground of Culpeper, but on horseback he never rode over any of the fields where his troops had been engaged, except for his journey to Pampatike soon after the surrender. All this was deliberate. Had he been able to do so he would have plowed up the trenches and would have followed the example he applauded of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife. On April 28, the general left Charleston for Wilmington, where he had been invited to stop. The northward route was by way of Florence to Mears Bluff. There, when the car stopped, a committee came to Lee's seat and asked him if he would go aboard a special train that had been sent out from Wilmington and would precede the regular locomotive to that city. The general consented, perforce, and left his coach to make the transfer. As he stepped to the platform, there was word of command, the roll of a drum, and a line of boys in gray uniforms presented arms as their band started to play. They were the cadets of Cape Fear Academy, under charge of one of Lee's old brigadiers, R. E. Colston, but they must have seemed tragically like the thousands Lee had beheld during the early days of the war, before their uniforms of gray had become bloody rags. If the general was affected by the sight of these cadets, he said nothing. He passed the cadets in silence and went aboard the special train into a car where only a few passengers were seated. They received him, according to a chronicler of the times, with a suppressed whisper of admiration, respectfully restrained, but when those who had clambered down to get a first glimpse of him came back into the coach, they began to crowd about him, to his evident embarrassment. In answer to questions, he said he would stop at Wilmington, probably for a day, but he begged that there be no further demonstration. Arriving at the brave old town that must have revived dark memories of Fort Fisher, he was escorted by the cadets to the home of George Davis, who had been attorney general in the Confederate cabinet. There, at last, was privacy, and with it, old acquaintanceship. For Mrs. Davis was an Alexandria woman, daughter of Dr. Orlando Fairfax, whose family had been friends of the Lees and Custises back in the peaceful old days before the politicians had revived the slavery question. A night of quiet, and then another day of crowds and receptions. Friends by the score called on him at the Davis house. The whole corps of the Cape Fear Academy came at his request, probably because he did not want them to feel that he was unappreciative of the honor they had sought to do him the previous evening. A dinner given by Mr. Davis brought to the house other friends and the celebrities of the town. Despite the crowded day, the general found time to call on Bishop Thomas Atkinson, who had been rector of a church in Baltimore when Lee had been stationed in that city. On April 30th Lee left Wilmington and went by way of Weldon to Portsmouth, Virginia, where he was to take the ferry across the Elizabeth River to Norfolk. As usual, word of his coming had preceded him and had brought a vast throng to the station. When he left the train a new surprise awaited him, Wilmington had welcomed him with a line of cadets, Portsmouth received him with a roaring salute. Some of the young men of the town had borrowed from one of the fire companies a cannon bearing the name of a contemporary journalist of passing fame, Brick Pomeroy, whom General Lee had met in Richmond at the beginning of his tour. With this gun they fired rounds in the general's honor. And, as a fitting companion when artillery was barking, there in the van of the crowd, waiting to greet his old chief, was Colonel Walter H. Taylor. With him, General Lee walked to the ferry, while the crowd outdid Brick Pomeroy in noisy greeting. Those shouts, noted the voracious analyst of Norfolk, were not of the measured hip hip hurrah kind now in vogue, but were the genuine old-fashioned Confederate yells. Behind Lee, as he slowly went aboard the ferry boat, were some hundreds of admiring Portsmouth people, anxious to have a sight of him or to share his company. He went into a cabin for the brief run across the river, and there he might have been overrun by enthusiastic admirers had not some of his friends guarded the door. Outside, Roman candles and rockets were being fired to notify the waiting multitude on the Norfolk side that the general was aboard. Before the boat was across the stream, the United Fire Company of Norfolk opened in salute with its cannon and continued to fire until the ferry was far in the slip. When Lee stepped ashore, the great throng began to cheer as loudly as had their neighbors on the other side of the Elizabeth. Amid the din of their welcoming shouts, with the rebel yell as a sharp, continuing accompaniment, the general was escorted to a carriage and was driven off quickly with Colonel Taylor. 
His Norfolk stopping place was the fine, quiet home of Dr. William Selden, bounded by Freemason Street, Bodetort Street, and the river. Faithful to long habit, Lee insisted on attending Sunday morning worship the day after his arrival, and he invited one of his host's daughters, Miss Caroline Selden, to go with him. The street was lined with adoring crowds, Miss Selden wrote. For one block before reaching Christ Church, we had almost to force our way through a narrow pathway they seemed to have left for him. Every hat was in the air, but being Sunday the homage was very quiet, and I well remember that he held his hat in his hand all the way. When Sunday was passed, William E. Taylor, father of Colonel Walter H. Taylor, gave a very elaborate dinner at which a number of Norfolk men were invited to meet the general. The Taylors were an old family with a wealth of silver, china, and glass, and they did their utmost to provide an evening of honor for the man whom Colonel Taylor so loyally had served. The Seldons tendered Lee a reception on the night of May 4, when many of his soldiers came to shake his hand and to gaze once more, and for the last time, on his calm countenance. They represented every station in life and many units of the Army of Northern Virginia. It probably was at this time that Brian called to see him, the faithful Brian of wartime headquarters. Another caller was a man who linked Lee with an earlier captain after whom many of his officers had sought to model, Emmanuel J. Myers, 89 and feeble, was brought to the Seldens and was introduced to General Lee. On his coat he wore the cross of the Legion of Honor which he had received as a member of the Old Guard from the hands of Napoleon himself. This dinner, the reception, and a professional conference with Dr. Selden, who was a physician of high standing, consumed nearly all the general's strength. Rain kept him from making at least one anticipated call. On May 5 he bade farewell to his host's family and quietly left the city on the steamer that ran up the James to the river plantations he intended to visit. His one regret was that so many residents of Norfolk were leaving their city to get work. Virginia needs her young men, he said. First he stopped again at the lower of the three Harrison estates called Brandon. The mistress of Lower Brandon, Mrs. Isabella Ritchie Harrison, and her kin were people he had known long and affectionately. The atmosphere was that he loved best. There were no crowds to cheer him, no receptions to tire him. He could relax, almost for the first time since March 24, when he had left Lexington. He drove to the other Brandons, saw all his friends and connections in the neighborhood, went to church on Sunday, May 8, wrote a few family letters and enjoyed the delights of the place. Brandon is looking very beautiful, he told Mrs. Lee, and it is refreshing to look at the river. The garden is filled with flowers and abounds in roses. The yellow jasmine is still in bloom and perfumes the atmosphere. He was being now to talk of returning to Lexington and methodically set the tentative date for May 24, precisely two months from the time he had left home. From Brandon, Lee went to Shirley, by prearrangement, with Hill Carter. He arrived with Agnes on Tuesday, May 10, and spent there the better of two days, in calm like that of Brandon, and doubtless in much happiness of soul. In 1868, it will be remembered, he had expressed a desire to go once more to Shirley and had questioned whether he ever would do so again, now he was there, with a sure premonition that he was looking for the last time on the garden, on the fine old house, and on Peel's famous portrait of his hero, Washington. No record of his stay at Shirley remains except the epigram of one of the daughters of the house, who has since died. She recalled the great dignity and kindness of General Lee's bearing, his willingness to autograph his pictures for them, and his old fondness for having his hands tickled. We regarded him with the greatest veneration. She concluded, we had heard of God, but here was General Lee. While the general had been in Savannah, Mrs. Lee had carried out a long-cherished plan of visiting Rooney at the White House. The general had not believed she would go, and when he had urged her in March to begin her preparations for the journey, she had replied, rather disdainfully, she had none to make, they have been made years ago. On April 20 she had arrived in Richmond by the James River and Kanawha Canal and had then taken the railroad to the White House. General Lee planned to join her there and to visit his sons on their farms, and he would have driven directly across country from Shirley had not Agnes decided to accompany him. As her baggage would have required a wagon, which would have had to cover 25 miles of bad roads, the general decided to go on to Richmond by steamer and finish the journey by rail. He accordingly left the old Carter plantation on Thursday, May 12, and arrived at Rooney's home that evening. 
Aside from a few familiars, there were no other guests at the White House. The general was free to rest and to play with his small grandson and namesake, to whom he was much attached. During his stay he rode over alone to spend a brief time with his bachelor son Robert at his plantation. The general knew, of course, that Robert lived in the former overseer's house at Roman Coke while planning to build a home. He knew, too, that men who were struggling with the land and keeping Bach, in the Virginia phrase, did not live elaborately. But he was not prepared for what he saw when Robert drove him up to the entrance. The house was small and crude in design, was 75 years old, and had a roof that because of disrepair sagged in the middle. The interior was even worse. My father, wrote Robert, always dignified and self-contained, rarely gave any evidence of being astonished or startled. His self-control was great and his emotions were not on the surface, but when he entered and looked around my bachelor quarters he appeared really much shocked. Robert was so much better off at the time than he had been in the early days of his venture at Roman Coke that he had some pride in his advancement and consequently he was not, perhaps, altogether prepared for his father's dismay. However, with his usual tact, the general relieved all possible embarrassment by making a jest of Robert's surroundings. When, however, they sat down at table, supplied with a scant store of battered and nondescript china and cutlery, the father could not withhold suggestion that the son might advantageously lay out a small sum to improve the equipment of the mansion. Lee's only other visit was to White Marsh, the home of Dr. Prosser Tabb, in Gloucester County. Mrs. Tabb was cousin Rebecca to the whole Lee family and had been a favorite with General Lee for forty years. She had been most urgent that he come to see her and permit the young people of the household to get acquainted with him. He and Robert drove to West Point, put their conveyance aboard the Baltimore steamer, and went very comfortably to Capahoosic Wharf. When the boat reached the landing the passengers crowded in so much to the port side, in order to see the general, that the gangway was below the level of the wharf. The captain had to order all of them to starboard so as to right the ship, whereupon Robert got his vehicle ashore. It was late afternoon by this time, and as it was getting chilly, the younger men drove rapidly to save his father from exposure to the night air. The general made no comment, but he did not fail to observe the hard treatment of the horse. So much was he distressed by it that he told several people, I think Rob drives unnecessarily fast, a remark that youth in every generation has heard. Hearty welcome and a large company of kinsfolk and friends awaited Lee at the Tab homestead. A pleasant evening was followed by a long night's rest, with Robert and his father sleeping in the same bed, because of the crowded house. It was the first time this had happened in many years, and the general remarked the fact, recalling affectionately that when Robert had been a little lad he had begged to sleep with him. After breakfast the next morning the general walked through the gardens and then went for a drive with Dr. Tab and Robert, under the care of the doctor's overseer, Graves, by name. Lee praised Graves' husbandry and wholly won his heart, whereupon Dr. Tabb told the general that the man was one of the old soldiers of the Army of Northern Virginia and had fought to the end at Appomattox. Lee, of course, proceeded to extol him the more. The overseer made no pretenses. Yes, general, he said, I stuck to the army, but if you had in your entire command a greater coward than I was, you ought to have had him shot. Lee was much amused and repeated the answer when he got back to the house. That sort of coward makes a good soldier, he said. Declining the reception the tabs wished to give him, the general rested as much as he could, had dinner with some special guests, and enjoyed talk with his young cousins. It was while chatting with one of them that Lee made the remark that has been, in some sense, the slogan of Virginia ever since. The youthful kinswoman had asked despairingly what fate held for us poor Virginians. Earnestly the general answered. You can work for Virginia, to build her up again, to make her great again. You can teach your children to love and cherish her. After a night made restless by his fear that he might oversleep himself, Lee caught the steamer early the next morning and went back up the river with his son. Robert left the boat at West Point, in order to take his horse home, and the general went on to the White House, where the steamer stopped and Rooney met him. Another period of rest at Fitzhugh's, and then, with many farewells, he took the train for Richmond on the morning of May 22, ten days after his arrival at the White House. Mrs. Lee remained, but Agnes accompanied him, and Robert went up for the day as a filial guard of honor. 
From May 22 to May 26, the general remained in Richmond. He went shopping at least once and bought a set of heavily plated knives and forks, which he sent to Robert. Much of his time was given over to medical examination by the Richmond doctors who had gone over him before he began his southern tour. I am to have a great medicine talk tomorrow, he wrote rather grimly on the day of his arrival. He had to endure, also, what must have seemed, in prospect, equally distasteful, measurement for a bust that was to be made of him. But the young artist who did the work was gentle, deft, and considerate, a cultured man and a good conversationalist. The general and he soon understood each other. When the sculptor, E. V. Valentine, remarked that the war had greatly altered his fortunes, General Lee answered quietly, his humor was never boisterous, that an artist ought not to have too much money. Later, as the conversation turned again to adversity, Lee observed, misfortune nobly born is good fortune. Valentine at the time thought this was original with General Lee, but subsequently, in reading the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, he found the sentence there. No more appropriate epitaph, wrote Mr. Valentine, could be carved on the tomb of the great Virginian. The sculptor could not have known at the time, of course, that Lee got his admiration for Marcus Aurelius from his father, who placed that emperor high among his venerated immortals. The artist at length completed his measurements and explained that he would have to go to Lexington to do the modeling and could do so either immediately or in the autumn. He gave no reasons, but the young statuary understood that Lee thought his end was near at hand. On May 26, Lee left Richmond for the last time. He had remained as quiet as possible during his stay in the city and had acquainted few of his friends with his presence. It is likely that on his final departure from the capital he had defended for three years, there were few at the station to bid him farewell. He passed from the central scene of his life's drama as though he had been the humblest actor on its stage. Apparently the route he took was to Charlottesville by the old Virginia Central, thence to Lynchburg by the Orange and Alexandria, now the South, and on to Lexington by the Packet. He reached home on the morning of May 28, two months and four days from the time he had left. Physically, he was little the better for the tour. The day after his arrival in Savannah the general had written Mrs. Lee, I think I am stronger than when I left Lexington, but otherwise can see no difference. Five days later he had said, I hope I am a little better. I seem to be stronger and to walk with less difficulty, but it may be owing to the better streets of Savannah. I do not think traveling in this way procures me much quiet and repose. Again, on April 11 he had written, The warm weather has dispelled some of the rheumatic pains in my back, but I perceive no change in the stricture in my chest. If I attempt to walk beyond a very slow gait, the pain is always there. It is all true what the doctors say about its being aggravated by any fresh cold, but how to avoid taking cold is the question. It seems with me to be impossible. Everything and anything seems to give me one. I meet with much kindness and consideration, but fear that nothing will relieve my complaint, which is fixed and old. I must bear it. He had enjoyed his trip up the St. John's River more than any other part of his tour, and when he had returned to Savannah he had felt improvement, but he found some of his symptoms aggravated. I hope I am better, he had repeated on April 18, I know I am stronger, but I still have the pain in my chest whenever I walk. I have felt it also occasionally of late when quiescent, but not badly, which is new. He had continued under heavy strain, with calls, receptions, much letter-writing in answer to invitations, and endless interruptions by visitors. Savannah physicians who had examined him for about an hour on April 18, at the instance of friends, had confirmed the previous diagnosis but had been somewhat encouraging in their agreement that the heart had not been injured and that the pericardium might not be involved. Lee had not tied to the hope they had held out. Perhaps their opinion is not fully matured, he had said. The visits to Charleston and Wilmington had been particularly wearing because so many social events had been crowded into so brief a time. He probably had been at his lowest ebb when he had reached Norfolk and had found some rest at Dr. Selden's. Reports that he had heart disease had now become public property, and at Wilmington he had told friends that he was sure his ailment was of the heart and that it was incurable. He had begun to gain some ground from the time he had gone to Brandon. In fact, if he had not sought quiet when he did, it is altogether probable that he would have died on the road. 
When he had reached the White House, Mrs. Lee had been disturbed at his appearance. He looks fatter, she had observed, but I do not like his complexion, and he seems still very stiff. Now that he was home, though he seemed buoyed up for the time, there was no real improvement, his malady was progressive. Precisely what that malady was, his physicians, whether neither agreed nor positive. The diagnosis of simple pericarditis tentatively made in 1870 did not adequately explain his symptoms then and does not satisfy the present-day clinician. The illness of 1863, from which his trouble dated, may have been an acute pericarditis secondary to his throat infection. Later, he probably had a combination of maladies. His serious heart condition was almost certainly angina pectoris rather than rheumatism, as he thought. This angina, his principal malady, may have been accompanied by a chronic adhesive pericarditis. In addition, he had some arthritis and a hardening of the arteries, which was rapid after 1866, if the changes shown in his photographs may be accepted as evidence. These two major conditions, the angina and the arteriosclerosis, evidence the effects of the war and of the reconstruction on a system that had originally been very strong. The psychological effect of the Southern tour on Lee himself is not easily determined because he said very little about it. He must have felt deep satisfaction, of course, that the South was looking courageously to the future and was laboring to recover what had been lost during the war. Personally, it was not his nature to indulge any pride in the affection the people displayed, though he was gratefully appreciative of their kindness to him. In general, the effects were cumulative of those that followed his visit to Petersburg in November, 1867, when, for the first time, he had seen how the southern people were shaking off the war. The only difference was that he now felt his end was at hand. He had paid his final visit of respect to the grave of his daughter and to the burial place of his father and the early home of his mother. For the last time, he had greeted many of those who had executed his orders and had fought his battles. He had consciously said farewell. The impressions made on the public by the tour were all favorable and in many ways helpful. It meant much to the generation of Woodrow Wilson to have seen General Lee. So it was, also, with those elders who had read of his campaigns but had never looked upon him. As for his old soldiers, the memories of their days of triumph overcame, in his presence, the hard realities of life. Their cause was personified and glorified in him and they felt themselves enriched by their association with him. Even in the North, among people of liberal mind, his avoidance on his travels of everything that would keep alive the old animosities aroused a measure of admiration. It will be seen, the New York World commented, that the Southern heart is still fired by emotions that kindled the late civil strife, and it is pleasant to witness the dignified and temperate course of General Lee in the midst of these heartfelt orations, ovations. The name of Lee is identified with the most heroic deeds of the war for independence, and it is pleasant in these latter days to find it connected with words and acts of fraternal reconciliation and pacification.